up next, we take you to Capitol Hill for coverage of a House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee hearing. Members of the Health Subcommittee look at legislation which would prescribe the labeling for packages and the advertising for tobacco and tobacco products. The measure would also restrict the advertising of tobacco products. The panel is chaired by Congressman Henry Waxman, a Democrat from California, and among the witnesses are James Mason, Assistant Secretary of Health for the Department of Health and Human Services, and Michael Mangano, the Department's Inspector General. They were joined by a panel of representatives from hospitals and private consumer and health groups. The meeting of the subcommittee will please come to order. Guests, kindly take your seats. This morning, the subcommittee will receive testimony on H.R. 5041, the Tobacco Control and Health Protection Act. The legislation proposes a comprehensive and long overdue reform of federal tobacco control policy, modeled after successful controls of the advertising and promotion of tobacco products launched in Canada, Australia, and France. The legislation proposes stronger, more prominent warning labels to increase public awareness of the adverse health effects of smoking. It places restrictions on the advertising and promotion of tobacco products, prohibits tobacco companies from distributing free samples, and requires states to enforce laws prohibiting the sale of tobacco to children. Today we'll hear from the tobacco industry that the public knows enough already about the role of cigarettes in causing cancer, heart disease, and emphysema. While we have heard these arguments before, the warnings proposed by this bill speak to new issues. Addiction. Tobacco is a powerfully addicting substance, which explains why smokers have such a tough time quitting. Stroke. Cigarette sm smoking is a major cause of stroke the nation's third leading cause of death. Involuntary smoking. Involuntary smoking increases the risk of disease in healthy non-smokers. This is new information that should be displayed in a special high visibility format. A major motivation for the legislation is the continuing use of tobacco by children. It has become increasingly clear that the U.S. tobacco industry has pursued a marketing policy dependent upon recruiting youthful smokers. Three million Americans under the age of 18 smoke 947 million packs of cigarettes a year. Each day, 3,000 young people, many still in elementary school, strike the first match of what may become a lifelong and life-threatening addiction. Despite the existence of restrictions on the sale of tobacco to young people in 45 states, we now know that the, what the industry has known for years. States do not enforce laws prohibiting the sale of tobacco to minors. Lax enforcement and the continued availability of cigarettes through vending machines make a mockery of tobacco control efforts. In fact, the Surgeon General's 1989 report concluded that the number of legal restrictions on children's access to tobacco products has decreased over the past quarter century. Today we'll hear from the Inspector General that despite state prohibitions, it's easy for children to buy cigarettes. The tobacco and advertising industries say they don't want kids to smoke. Well, that's pretty hard to believe. The industry does nothing to stop youthful smoking because younger smokers are essential to replace the millions of smokers lost annually to death and to quitting. Youthful smoking is essential to the long-term stability of the tobacco industry. It's the driving force of their marketing strategy. We cannot look to the tobacco industry for help in stopping the sale of tobacco products to children. Here, government has a responsibility. H.R. 5041 ensures that laws against the sale of tobacco by minors are enforced while strengthening health warning labels and prohibiting advertising which appeals to youth. When the 1984 cigarette labeling law was passed, the U.S. was a pioneer in tobacco control. Since that time, however, a number of other 
Western nations, most notably Canada, have enacted strong laws to discourage tobacco sales, particularly to young people. It's now time for the U.S. to assert its public health leadership. If we're serious about reducing the adverse health effects of smoking, it's time to treat tobacco like the dangerous public health threat it represents. We're looking forward to the testimony today of a number of witnesses. I know there's been a great deal of interest in this hearing. A number of individuals on both sides of the issue have requested the opportunity to testify. Although the subcommittee invited uh, three representatives of the various advertising aid industries to appear, a number of industry members continue to be disappointed they weren't invited to present oral testimony. Unfortunately, our schedule doesn't permit every single individual who wants to come in and present testimony. What we've done is uh, try to balance this out. We've gone to great lengths, and in fact, a greater number of witnesses have been invited to testify in opposition to the bill than in support. In addition, as is our custom, all witnesses who request to testify have been offered the opportunity to present their views in writing for inclusion, inclusion in the hearing record. And that opportunity will be available to everyone so that their views will be part of the record today. I want to call on members of the subcommittee for opening statements and turn first to uh, Mr. Blyley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, H.R. 5041 is the most draconian, punitive, anti-tobacco, anti-First Amendment legislation that has been considered by this subcommittee during the 10 years I have served on it. This bill is so draconian, so extreme, that it even goes so far as to ban this infamous and deadly chocolate cigar. Recently handed out by one of my staff members to celebrate the birth of a new child. I want to take this opportunity to briefly summarize some of the legislation's infirmities. First, the legislation proposes to alter the existing system of warning labels for both cigarettes and smokeless tobacco products by altering both the content and format of the labels. The new warnings certainly cannot be justified on the grounds that they will in any way increase the public's perception that cigarette smoking is not healthy. The only purpose these new warnings and warning formats can serve is to heighten hostility to the products and their users. Second, while the legislation purports to simply restrict the format of advertising and promotion, it is in fact an attempt to create a format so onerous that manufacturers will cease to advertise. In other words, a de facto advertising ban. This is clearly unconstitutional, as we will hear from several witnesses today. Clearly, Congress cannot ban truthful speech about lawful products without infringing on the First Amendment. The recent Peel decision serves to reinforce the contention that such legislation is unconstitutional. Third, the ban on promotion and sponsorship also fails the test of constitutionality and is supportable only if one believes that our society should be one in which we banish any and all mention of unpopular products and ideas. I challenge anyone to make a compelling case that a car charging around the track at 220 miles an hour with Marlboro emblazoned on it causes anyone to take up the smoking habit or for that matter, that one bearing the Domino's pizza logo causes people to take up the pizza habit. Fourth, the suggestion that federal funds should be withheld from states unless they implement model sales to minors legislation similar to that proposed by Secretary Sullivan is wrong-headed, even though well-intentioned. I take umbrage at the suggestion that someone who is old enough to vote to elect a president senator, congressman, governor, etc., and who is old enough to die for his country on foreign soil is somehow incapable of making an informed decision as, well as to whether or not to smoke. Fifth, the repeal of the existing preemption contained in the Federal Cigarette Labeling and Advertising Act and its replacement by Section 13 would grant state and local governments the authority to regulate what advertising would be allowed to continue and would empower judges and juries to impose liability on manufacturers 
for failing to provide warnings deemed after the fact to be required under state's tort law. In other words, we will tell manufacturers what they must say and then hold them liable because they obey the law. Sixth, the legislation would require public disclosure of trade secret information, namely additives or ingredients. This information is already provided to the Secretary of HHS under the Comprehensive Smoking Education Act. Under that act, the Secretary is directed to advise Congress on those ingredients that, in his judgment, quote, pose a health risk to cigarette smokers, unquote. Indeed, Secretary Sullivan, no fan of tobacco or tobacco products, has testified in the other body that legislation to direct to regulate tobacco product ingredients is not needed. Seventh, the notion that we need another expensive federal bureaucracy to spend millions, if not billions, of federal tax dollars telling people what they already to believe is not prudent in the current budgetary climate. The fact is more Americans believe smoking is harmful to one's health than know that George Washington was the first president of the United States. I know some of the groups that will testify today would like to see government paid advertising of the California variety at the federal level. Mr. Chairman, what will be next? Government sponsored ad telling us not to eat red meat, not to drink too much milk or coffee, or government sponsored ads against unions, pro-life or pro-abortion groups. Eighth, the private right of action provision which grants special legal privileges to nonprofit anti-smoking groups represents bad policy. Since many of these organizations participated in the drafting of this legislation, I think it reinforces the fact that, that these organizations believe their view is the only one that deserves consideration and recognition, and that those views are the only possible correct ones. Should this legislation contain a provision to allow tobacco workers and farmers a right of private action against any government official or voluntary health organization official who makes statements or takes actions on tobacco issues in a fashion which injures them without being able to conclusively back up the claims he's making? Or a special right of action against a voluntary nonprofit health organization which files false disclosure information with government agencies? <clears throat> this list is by no means exhaustive, but demonstrates just how zealous and punitive this legislation is. If you cannot tell, Mr. Chairman, I I uh, intend to oppose the legislation. <laughs> In closing, I would like to make a couple of additional comments. This legislation is comprehensive. It deserves careful and complete scrutiny before any attempt is made to move it forward. I hope, Mr. Chairman, that rumors concerning a hasty markup of this bill are false. I certainly hope that we will have at least one additional day of hearings to afford the many individuals who requested the opportunity to testify today, but were told they could not uh, the, give them the opportunity to do so. I would note that I have been told that the only condition under which the ACLU is being allowed to testify was that it persuaded the Freedom to Advertise Coalition to give up its spot at the witness table. Mr. Chairman, as I said, I hope the rumor is false, that we can assure all interested and affected parties that they will have the opportunity to express their views on this legislation in a public hearing before we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blyla. I can assure you the rumor is false. Mr. Sinar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first of all, let me commend you and your staff for your leadership on this issue. As you know, I've been working for some time now to make the tobacco industry clean up its act. And when it comes to marketing and promoting their pro products, they simply aren't doing it. I'm grateful that this legislation which you've introduced includes the proposal I've been pushing. I guess the natural question to start with this morning is why is it appropriate for Congress to restrict the way tobacco products are advertised and why is it necessary to enact the Tobacco Control and Health Protection Act? Very simply, it is to prevent the unnecessary loss of human life. You know, in a recent speech by the Surgeon General, he indicated that five million teenagers would lose their life in the future as a result of smoking-related illnesses. Ninety percent of all smokers start while they're in their teenage years, and half of those start before the tender age of 14 years old. Tobacco advertising is targeted at our young people and at our youth. The models in the ads, the images portrayed, and the themes used all appeal to a youthful audience. The message in today's cigarette advertising is smoke so you'll be successful. 
glamorous, popular with the opposite sex. The advertisements conveniently fail to mention that when you smoke, you greatly increase your risk of heart disease, tuberculosis, cancer, and premature death. Given these conflicting signals, it's no wonder that the number of teens who begin smoking has not declined or that one-third of all teens in a recent survey were unaware that smoking was even harmful to their health. Now we're going to hear today that restricting tobacco advertising won't keep young people from smoking. That we've exaggerated the effect of the tobacco marketing and promotion in this country. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if advertising isn't effective, why would this industry spend nearly $3 billion a year marketing and promoting this product? Why wouldn't they aggressively pursue others who use their trademarks illegally? If they weren't marketing to kids, why would they give away CDs at rock group concerts instead of Frank Sinatra concerts? And why would they violate their own code of industry ethics in advertising? I've been asking those questions for years, and I've never gotten an answer to any of them. Finally, restricting tobacco advertising is constitutional. I challenge anybody in this room to find a stronger defender of the First Amendment of the Constitution than this member of Congress. I take my responsibility to uphold the Constitution very seriously, and I do so at sometimes political risk. I respect the opinion of the ACLU and other legal scholars with respect to the facts on constitutionality on tombstone advertising and whether or not it will uh, pass the constitutional mustard, but very honestly, I think they're dead wrong. Political speech is different from commercial speech. And given the direction of the Supreme Court's recent First Amendment cases, I'm confident these restrictions would be upheld. The bottom line is that only the nine justices on the Supreme Court know for sure how they'll stand on that issue. And the only way to settle this argument once and for all is to pass this legislation and let's fight it out in the courts. I'm prepared to have the courts rule on this issue and to live by those consequences. The other side isn't even willing to take that risk. I can only conclude they're not confident of their position. Mr. Chairman, in closing, I'd like to say that, this, that if this Congress was given the opportunity to prevent the loss of nearly a half a million lives a year and to reduce federal expenditures by billions of dollars, we'd jump at the chance. We completely rewrote the clinical laboratory regulations over much less. And yet, through enactment of this legislation, that is precisely the opportunity that is before us. We can save a half a million lives a year, $4 billion of Medicare payments, $23 billion of extra insurance premiums, $50 billion of lost productivity, but most importantly, we can save the lives of the five million children that we'll lose who will take up this habit. It saddens me that in this great country of the United States, which once led the world in protecting the health of its citizens from the harmful effects of tobacco, we've lost that leadership role to other countries. Thank you, Mr. Sinar. Mr. Whitaker? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to commend you for convening this hearing today on H.R. 5041, the Tobacco Control and Health Protection Act. I would also like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership in drafting this piece of legislation, which I believe is vital to the health of our nation. I also want to take this opportunity to thank our colleague, Congressman Mike Seinart, for the hard work and the dedication that he has put into the development of this legislation. I also want to thank the other members of our subcommittee who were original co-sponsors of the Tobacco Control and Health Protection Act, Mr. Nielsen, Mr. Schuler, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Sikorsky, Mr. Bates, and Mrs. Collins. Mr. Chairman, I don't need to convince you of the need for further regulation of tobacco products and uh, product promotion. Nearly 400,000 Americans die each year from tobacco-related diseases. Tobacco use is the largest preventable cause of disease and premature death in the United States. 
Cigarettes cause lung cancer, emphysema, heart disease, fetal injury, stroke, and a host of other serious and fatal afflictions. Further, tobacco, costs, tobacco use costs our society over $52 billion in added health care costs and lost productivity. It is the only product that used, as intended, kills. The need for further regulation of tobacco products and, and tobacco product promotion is clear. Failure to act is unconscionable. Passage of H.R. 5041, the Tobacco Control and Health Protection Act, will help the Congress to ensure that the health and welfare of the public is protected to the maximum extent possible. Mr. Chairman, while I want to associate myself with the entire contents of H.R. 5041, I would like to address the majority of my opening remarks to those provisions of the bill which I believe that, that I have been most closely involved with, particularly the regulation of tobacco ingredients. As many of the people in this room know, tobacco regulations are a haphazard patchwork of incomplete and diminishing control. The tobacco industry has been very successful in having tobacco and tobacco products specifically exempted under all major laws enacted to regulate a variety of consumer products, such as the Consumer Product Safety Act, the Fair Labeling and Packaging Act, the Federal Hazardous Substance Act, the Controlled Substance Act, and the Toxic Substance Act. If tobacco products were to be first developed and marketed today, I cannot imagine the federal government allowing them to be sold openly and without restriction. Tobacco products contain hundreds, if not thousands, of chemical additives that are used as flavors and fillers. Many of the additives and ingredients used in tobacco products are either known or suspected of being carcinogens or co-carcinogens. However, no federal agency has the authority to require these additives be disclosed or even removed if they are found to be harmful. Mr. Chairman, I find that to be a travesty. Earlier this year, Perrier Mineral Water was recalled nationally and nationwide because of traces of benzene, a known carcinogen, were found in a few samples. At 20 parts per billion, an eight ounce serving of Perrier would contain approximately 4.7 micrograms of benzene. According to the 1986 Surgeon General's report, the mainstream smoke in a single cigarette contains 12 to 48 milligrams of benzene. That's in the neighborhood of three to 10 times the amount of benzene that was found in a bottle of Perrier. Unless it is occurring as we speak, Mr. Chairman, I have yet not heard of a nationwide recall because of the presence of benzene and tobacco products. H.R. 5041 would give the Secretary of Health and Human Services the authority to regulate tobacco products. Under this legislation, the label on tobacco products would be required to list all of the ingredients of the product in descending order of prominence. Further, if the Secretary finds that any of these additives or constituents are unsafe, the Secretary would have the authority to reduce or to eliminate those ingredients. The health of our nation demands nothing less. It is high time that the federal government and the American public should know what chemical additives are added into the cigarettes, and they should be able to determine if those additives are safe. Another important provision of H.R. 5041 would restore some truth in advertising to the way tobacco products are promoted. For example, take a look at some of the advertising that I've brought along with me today that are posted over here on the poster board. Now claims that their cigarettes are lowest in tar and nicotine. Vantage claims their ultralight brand has one half the tar than their competitor. Marlboro Lights and Virginia Slims claim that their Super Slim brand is, quote, the first low smoke cigarette for women, end of quote. And the list goes on and on. 
But what these ads are trying to make us believe is that low tar and low nicotine and low smoke cigarettes are safer. Mr. Chairman, I know of no scientific study or body that has declared that low tar, low nicotine, low smoke cigarettes safer than their higher tar, higher nicotine, higher smoke counterparts. It is exactly these types of implicit health claims that H.R. 5041 seeks to do away with. Under our legislation, such health claims could not be made unless the Secretary determines that such representation is actually significant in terms of affecting the health and the safety of the American public. In other words, tobacco advertisements could no longer deceive the public in the same manner as they currently do. Finally, I'd like to address the issue of smoking by our nation's children. More than 90% of all tobacco users begin while teenagers or younger. 50% of high school seniors who smoke begin by the seventh and the eighth grade. And 25% of all high school seniors who smoke be before or during the sixth grade. The tobacco industry admits that smoking is an adult activity, but they have done nothing to alter their advertising methods to keep their deadly and addictive message from reaching the most vulnerable of our society, our children. According to the tobacco industry's own voluntary code of advertising ethics, they do not target their products to minors and only attempt to promote brand loyalty and brand switching among adult smokers. If the industry's only concern is to encourage brand loyalty and brand switching among adult smokers, why do they continue to spend billions of dollars promoting their products with cartoons like the example that's on that poster board? It would seem to this member of Congress that if the tobacco industry was really only trying to encourage brand loyalty and brand switching among adult smokers, that they would be getting a very poor return on their investment. But we all know that the tobacco industry is getting a wonderful return on their $3 billion a year investment because they are recruiting significant numbers of younger, new smokers to replace those that they have either killed off or those who have had the courage and the ability to quit smoking. This legislation will go a long ways in keeping cigarettes and other deadly addictive tobacco products out of the hands of our nation's children. And I would urge all members of our subcommittee to put the health of our nation, especially our nation's youth, ahead of the profit margin of the tobacco industry. As I said before, Mr. Chairman, we have a moral obligation to address the nation's leading cause of preventable death. If we had the opportunity to address a known health hazard that was greater than the combined sum of heroin, cocaine, alcohol, fire, automobiles, homicide, suicide, all at once, I have no doubt that we would move quickly and decisively However, this is not a hypothetical situation. This is a reality, and it is exactly what we're dealing with today. Yet, with unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, I would like to enter into the record a copy of an article written by columnist Michael Kinsley that appeared in the April 26, 1990 issue of the Washington Post entitled Smoking and Stigma. He states, quote, soon I suspect we will look back on the past 26 years with puzzlement. How could we have acknowledged the harm smoking does and yet lived so comfortably with that knowledge? What will seem incredible, I think, is a relative absence of stigma associated with the production and the peddling of tobacco products, end of quote. I couldn't agree more. Tobacco product advertisements are, if not explicitly, certainly implicitly targeted directly at women, minorities, and children in ways that try to make smoking look healthy, glamorous, and sexy, when in reality, smoking is nothing more than slow motion suicide. Mr. Kinsley concludes his article by stating, quote, looking back, people will be as amazed by the existence of something such as the Virginia Slims tennis tournament as we are today by advertising slogans of the 1940s and the 1950s like more doctors smoke camels. I hope he's right. Again, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding this hearing today and I look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses today. 
and I hope that we can move quickly on this legislation so that we can give members of this subcommittee an opportunity to stand up for the health of our nation's citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. Mr. Sikorsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've heard it before and we'll hear it again and again this morning. 390,000 Americans die of diseases attributable to smoking each year. One out of every six deaths in America is the result of smoking, according to the Surgeon General 89 report. At this rate, in the decade of the 1990s, the equivalent of the entire population of the state of Minnesota will die from smoking in America. Tobacco is addictive. Tobacco kills. And the statistics on kids smoking are the most frightening. Over 3 million of America's children under age 18 smoke. Almost 6 million use tobacco. We've researched and studied and tabulated and qualified and quantified and document this public health threat to death, literally. It's time we did something about it. I'm proud to be an original sponsor of the Chairman's uh, Tobacco Control and Health Protection Act because this legislation will help reduce the most easily identifiable and controllable health risk in America. 3,000 children start smoking each day in America, in addition to the more than 3 million children under 18 who already smoke. The Inspector General's report illustrates the problems of kids' access to tobacco. Youth access laws are not being enforced. Children can buy cigarettes with ease. Again, law enforcement is weak or non-existent. Local leadership is often the sole impetus for enforcement, active enforcement, enforcement control, and that leadership generally doesn't exist in this country. I fought for the bill's strong provisions prohibiting tobacco sales to minors. These provisions will make access to federal substance abuse block grant funds contingent on prohibitions against tobacco sales to minors. White Bear Lake, near my home in Minnesota, was the first locality in the country to impose a ban on cigarette vending machines. That action spurred the state of Minnesota to act to stop vending machine sales to juveniles. Effective in two weeks, on August 1st of this year, Cigarette vending machines will be restricted in Minnesota to non-public places. In liquor establishments, the machine must be in a vicinity and control of a responsible employee. In other places, the machine must be located within the control of a responsible employee and operable only by insertion of electronic device or token. Minnesota doesn't preempt even more restrictive local laws. The tough federal cigarette vending machine restrictions incorporated in this bill will provide protection for all of America's children and the pocketbooks of America's taxpayers who pay for the health costs and lost productivity caused by the smoking scourge. Again, Mr. Chairman, I commend you and your staff for your outstanding work. I ask uh, that my entire statement be placed in the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Skorsky. Uh, Mr. Dannemeyer? Mr. Nielsen, Mr. Towns, we're uh, now prepared to hear from our first witnesses uh, who are colleagues of ours and uh, I'm pleased to see Mel Levine from my own state of California at the table. I'd like to call forward Congressman Steve Neal from the state of North Carolina and uh, I don't know if Congressman Durbin is here. Some members have requested an opportunity to have their statements in the record, and without objection, all members of the House who wish to have statements entered in the record will be permitted to do so. We're, we're pleased to have the two of you at our hearing this morning. Your prepared statements will be in the record in full. What we'd like to ask you to do is to limit your oral presentation to us to no more than five minutes. And Mr. Levine, why don't we start with you? There's a button. Yes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify before your subcommittee today. I want to commend you for your consistent leadership uh, in this important area. The legislation which you are considering today is of enormous importance to the health and the well-being of this nation's citizens. The terrible health costs of tobacco consumption have long been recognized and it is long overdue that we enact legislation to further discourage tobacco use and to counteract the pervasive influence of tobacco advertising and other tobacco company promotional efforts. Your legislation makes major strides in bringing our national health policies in line with known scientific data about the dangers of tobacco consumption. 
Despite the great value and significance of this legislation, I am here to suggest uh, one way in which this important legislation might be improved and strengthened. Although it deals with abuses by the tobacco industry in this country, H.R. 5041 does not address the nefarious promotional practices of U.S. tobacco companies operating abroad. Mr. Chairman, cigarettes are as deadly to citizens of Thailand, the Philippines, Latin America, and Africa as they are to Americans. Tobacco companies have presented no evidence to show that foreign smokers are somehow immune or less sensitive to the lung cancer, emphysema, birth defects, and heart disease that affect smokers in this country. If anything, Mr. Chairman, the risks of smoking are only compounded in countries where health care, nutrition, and prenatal care are inadequate, as they are in many lower-income countries around the globe. Nevertheless, U.S. tobacco companies remain actively engaged in promotional efforts and advertising of tobacco products in ways that would be illegal in the United States. I believe it is unconscionable for us to permit a double standard on what is literally an issue of life and death. It is particularly disconcerting that U.S. tobacco firms have targeted women and children abroad, groups that traditionally have not smoked in great numbers and therefore provide the highest potential growth market. I know that your subcommittee has seen hard evidence of such practices in the form of kites, school book covers, children's swim trunks, and other products that prominently display tobacco company logos and products abroad. These promotional items clearly aren't aimed at getting at adult smokers, as Mr. Whitaker indicated in his comments with regard to the domestic market. They are clearly not aimed at getting adult smokers to switch brands, as the tobacco industry claims. Cigarettes are sold abroad without any health warnings or cautions, despite the long-standing and overwhelming evidence of which the committee is well aware that cigarettes kill. Mr. Chairman, as you know, I have introduced legislation, H.R. 1249, which would require that tobacco products sold abroad carry the same warning labels on packaging and advertising as tobacco products sold in this country. I'm very pleased that your bill makes much needed improvements in product package labeling and would strongly urge that those same, product, that those same labels be required on all U.S. tobacco products, including those sold abroad. My bill would further require that U.S. companies abide by the same restrictions on advertising as required in the U.S. If it is illegal for tobacco companies to lure new smokers with television advertising in the United States, we should also not permit them to do so in Ghana, Taiwan, or anywhere else. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman it is simply a moral compromise for us to have one set of health standards for Americans and another for foreign nationals whom we are urging to uh, use our products. As former Surgeon General C. Everett Koop has warned, our cynical disregard for the health of foreign consumers as we push this hazardous product has won us nothing but opprobrium abroad. The findings in your bill put the cost of U.S. tobacco consumption at a phenomenal $67 billion a year. These are costs that the U.S. health care system and economy can ill afford. One would surely have to multiply this figure many times over to arrive at the worldwide cost of this terrible addiction. I would point out that many nations are substantially less able than we are to sustain these enormous costs in foreshortened lives, health care, and loss of productivity. I believe we should be leading the world in helping people kick the habit, not pushing our deadly product on foreign consumers while we discourage our own citizens from smoking. So, Mr. Chairman, I am here today to urge the committee to consider incorporating into your legislation language similar to that in my legislation, H.R. 1249, which would require that the health dangers of tobacco be disclosed regardless of where the product is sold. As a, as a basic issue of morality and concern for the health of the world's citizens, we should place the same labeling requirements and advertising restrictions on all of our products. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Levine. Mr. Neal? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's a button on the base of the mic. Push it forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, do thank you and all the members of the committee, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify uh, today. I'm here representing my constituents. As you may know, uh, tobacco is a bedrock industry of our part of North Carolina. The Reynolds Tobacco Company employs about 
8,000 people in and around my hometown each year. Uh, it pumps more than $1.3 billion into our local economy. American Tobacco Company is also in my congressional district, employs about 1,400 people, has a huge payroll also. In addition, I represent thousands of small tobacco farmers. Tobacco income has built our homes, our schools, our churches, our parks, it, in fact, everything that uh, constitutes a community. Tobacco is as important to North Carolina as oil is to Texas, and it has been so, Mr. Chairman, since before this country existed as a country. Now, you may think I'm ranging far afield from the subject of this hearing, but I don't think so. I mention all of this because I want the subcommittee to understand that tobacco is produced by thousands of good, decent, hardworking people, the same kind of people you represent in your congressional districts. These people make significant contributions to this country, uh, and for one thing, they produce a product that yields over $11 billion a year in federal, state, and local taxes, which do all the good things that, as you know, that those taxes do. Their product is a legal one that has been legal before the beginning of the country, and it is purchased by millions of Americans who make a free choice to use it. Uh, as you consider legislation like this, I hope you will give fair consideration to these people and to the people who choose freely to use these products. Our society has long valued and protected the individual's right to choose, to make personal choices without government interference. It's our obligation as members of this Congress to defend that freedom. It's the one oath that we take. Now, I know that many members of this subcommittee recently voted, as did I, against a proposed constitutional amendment on flag burning. Mr. Chairman, I, as all of you, I know, despise any desecration or abuse of the American flag. I feel nothing but contempt for the flag burners, as I know you do, but at the same time, I know, as do you, I love the First Amendment. The Bill of Rights is the heart and soul of our Constitution, and the First Amendment is the heart and soul of the Bill of Rights. I couldn't vote to dilute the Bill of Rights. Most of you couldn't either, even from something I hate. And yet, my worry is that that's what you all are considering today. You're con discussing a bill that would ride roughshod over the First Amendment by severely regulating and controlling the advertising of a lawful product. I know that the chairman and members of this subcommittee are sincerely concerned about the health of the American people. Among the best members of Congress are on this committee. I want to point out to you, though, that other values are at issue here also. And your bill, H.R. 5041, would lead us down a dangerous path. The bill would prevent cigarette manufacturers from using pictures or images in their advertising. It would make these ads essentially invisible, except, I suppose, for warning labels. It would severely restrict and censor uh, advertising, as uh, you well know. Um, Finally, of course, the bill would take what advertising might still be left and invite state and local governments to ban it. Mr. Chairman, this bill is harsh and unnecessary. I urge that you consider this issue in the context of individual freedom. Cigarettes are and always have been a legal product in the United States. Millions of Americans have chosen to smoke them notwithstanding prominent health warnings and anti-smoking campaigns, which I understand the overwhelming majority of the American public believe. We shouldn't punish people, American citizens who make this choice, nor should we suspend the constitutional rights of those who manufacture 
these products. And Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement, but I'd like to comment, if I can, on a couple of other statements that were made here. One is made often that tobacco products are the only products that used as intended do damage to health. And I would point out to you that there are health consequences from, the, I'm told, and I believe myself, from the use of too much steak or milk or eggs or cheese or sugar or beef or a range of other products if used as intended. Now this uh, makes good headlines, I guess, but it is factually incorrect. And I also question this comment about uh, cigarettes the, ab the impact of cigarette advertising on young people, causing young people to smoke. I smoked as a young person. I started smoking when I was a teenager. And I've thought long and hard about this because I didn't want my children to smoke. My children are up in their 20s now and they don't smoke, I'm happy to say. That was my, uh, that was my uh, urging. I urged them not to smoke. They uh, took that to heart. When they were small, now they are at an age when they can make uh, their own decision. I smoked as a uh, teenager. As I say, I thought uh, long and hard about it. I don't think advertising had one thing to do with it. I think it was a galaxy of other things. I thought that at the time it was considered to be cool or that uh, mature in some way. I, it, it had to do with what I think we now refer to as peer pressure but I don't believe it had to, uh, that advertising uh, was the cause of it. And I think I, I mention these things because I think we really ought to try to deal with the issue as it is, not with the mythology of it. And I thank you again for the opportunity to uh, be here with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Neal and Mr. Levine, for your testimony. I appreciate the point of view that you're raising. Mr. Neal, the only thing I would say to you is that uh, what brought you to smoke and brought me at a time when I was uh, young to smoke and many others was the fact that it was an acceptable and in fact attractive habit the way it was presented to us. And I think that Mr. Whitaker put his finger on the whole issue when we don't have the stigma attached to it, the way we have a stigma attached to other very dangerous activities. I don't think prohibition would work. We tried it with alcoholic beverages and it didn't, it was a great failure. But while people are making the choice and we allow them that choice, whether to smoke or not to smoke, you have the reality of close to $3 billion being spent each year more to promote cigarette smoking than to promote any other sale of a product or service in this country. And that promotional activity is to try to keep this habit acceptable, to keep the smoking uh, something that uh, will be attractive, and in, and in fact, I believe it is geared to getting young people to smoke, not because they see a billboard, but because they have a, a sense that they and their peers are gonna grow up faster and be more successful in all the ways that, the, that those ads make them think they're gonna be successful if they do pick up this habit. So I, I disagree with you, as you know, on this issue. I have the highest regard for you personally, and I understand you're representing your constituents. But uh, in terms of national policy, we let people make that choice. We just don't think the choice ought to be so weighted where the advertisers can spend $3 billion to continue to uh, uh, promote this habit. Mr. Bliley, you have any questions or comments? Uh, any uh, members seek uh, recognition? Uh, we know you have a busy schedule. We thank you very much for thank being with you. us. We'll look forward to working with you on the legislation. Our um, next witnesses are appearing on behalf of the Department of Health and Human Services. James O. Mason is the Assistant Secretary for Health. Michael Mangano is the Deputy Inspector General for Evaluation and Inspection within the Office of Inspector General. And we're pleased to have both of you here. Your prepared statements are going to be in the record in full. We'd like to ask if you would to limit your oral presentation to no more than five uh, minutes. And Dr. Mason, why don't we start Mr. with you? Uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Mangano, why don't we start with you? Okay. I'm sure Thank to pull the microphone close. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to be with you here this morning to brief you on the recent Inspector General study that we've completed entitled Youth Access to Cigarettes. In March 1990, the Secretary asked us to conduct a study regarding the enforcement of laws prohibiting youth access to cigarettes. The specific purposes the Secretary wanted us to get at was to determine the extent to which state laws are enforced, to assess the nature of enforcement, and identify effective practices which might improve enforcement. Now let me tell you what we found. Forty-five states in the District of Columbia have laws which now make it illegal to sell to minors. That leaves Louisiana, Missouri, Montana, New Mexico, and Wyoming in a small minority of states without such laws. Despite the fact that a vast majority of states have laws prohibiting the sale of cigarettes to minors, all available evidence tells us that these laws are not being enforced and children can still buy cigarettes. Two-thirds of the state public health department officials reported that there was virtually no enforcement in their state law. Law enforcement officials said that other enforcement priorities and the reluctance to take such cases in already crowded court systems dampened their enthusiasm to actively enforce such laws. In most communities, kids can buy cigarettes without too much trouble. Over 80 percent of the minors and 62 percent of the vendors in the OIG sample shared that opinion. Despite the easy access and lack of enforcement, most beneficiaries are aware of the youth access laws in their states. Three th quarters of the students know these laws along with 91 percent of the vendors. We identified 11 jurisdictions, however, where officials have made serious attempts to prevent the sale of cigarettes to minors. Generally, these enforcement initiatives have emerged as a result of local concern and commitment. Active enforcement involves a variety of techniques, primarily administrative in nature. Among the most commonly used techniques are licensing, fines, stings, restrictions on vending machines, and warning signs. In eight of the 11 enforcement sites, vendors license to sell cigarettes, to sell alcohol, and to sell even food may be suspended or revoked after a prescribed number of violations. This more directly affects sales and vendor income than a small fine. Income from the fees can be used to pay for the enforcement. Seven of the sites can impose civil rather than criminal uh, penalties on violators. Civil uh, penalties have three distinct advantages to criminal penalties. First, this mechanism allows health officials and licensing officials to cite violators rather than police officers. Second, civil penalties engender more community support as the residents feel the criminal penalties are too severe. And third, use of the civil penalty avoids clogging the criminal justice system. All but two of these ac active sites use stings to enforce youth access laws. These stings, known as controlled purchases, involved using teenagers to test vendors and their compliance with the law. Officials in these sites argue that the stings are the only viable way to monitor compliance with the law, relying on complaints is insufficient. Total bans, locking devices, or limiting placement of cigarette vending machines is required in seven of these sites. A study by the National Automatic Merchandising Association found that vending machines account for 16 percent of the sales to minors. Six of the active sites require that signs be placed at the point of sale, stating it is illegal to sell to children under a certain age. In six of the 11 sites, it is illegal for a minor to purchase or possess a cigarette, and violations result in penalties that range from five hours of community service to a $50 fine. That completes a summary of my statement, and I'll be prepared to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Dr. Mason, I want to hear from you. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Could you uh, be sure to turn the mic on? There's a button on the base. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. We appreciate the attention you and, and others are giving to the problem of tobacco and health and we commend the care and thought which went into preparation of this proposed legislation. In 1988, total advertising and promotion expenditures by the tobacco industry reached $3.3 billion in the United States. This compares with $1.5 billion as recently as 1981, an increase far greater than inflation. Importantly, the emphasis of this spending has changed. In 1981, about two-thirds was for traditional advertising. About one-third was for promotional activities, such as sponsoring athletic events and providing free packs of cigarettes. By 1988, fully two-thirds was spent on promotion and only one-third on traditional advertising. Money spent on promotional activities increased from about a half a billion dollars in 1981 to 2.2 billion in 1988, more than a four-fold increase in seven years. It is likely that the failure of teenage smoking rates to drop in the last decade is related to this massive barrage of promotional activities. 
Secretary Sullivan has undertaken a number of initiatives related to smoking. He has written to hospital associations urging establishment of smoke-free hospitals, raised the issue of advertising in youth with athletes and publishers, and directed that existing HHS resources be targeted towards innovative, effective tactics against smoking. The year 2000 health goals for the nation will include a number of health-related goals. Some one million teens start smoking each year. About 90% of adult smokers begin their addiction as children or adolescents. So the conclusion is clear. These young smokers account for almost all of our future health problems related to tobacco. Preventing young for youngsters from taking up smoking is far more cost-effective than treating addiction later in life and far less expensive than treating the resulting diseases. The tobacco industry profits handsomely from the seduction of our children into nicotine addiction. In fact, according to a study published recently, tobacco companies earn a profit of $221 million annually from tobacco sales to children. These profits come from the sale of some 947 million packs of cigarettes and 26 million containers of smokeless tobacco. In May of this year, Secretary Sullivan announced a major new initiative to deal with this disgrace. This initiative is based in part on a recent report that we heard today from the Inspector General and his staff. Their findings have already been discussed in detail. Departmental staff use some of the findings of the Inspector General study to develop a model law which states could adopt. Secretary Sullivan has recently released the proposed legislation called Model Sale of Tobacco Products to Minors Control Act and recommended that every state consider enacting laws along these lines. We are working with the leadership of the National Governors Association and other groups to ensure that the model bill is considered in each and every state. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I would like to have a copy of the model law introduced into the record. Without objection, I will Thank you. Its main features are as follows. It would create a licensing system similar to that used to control the sale of alcoholic beverages. Thus, a store could sell tobacco to adults only if it avoids selling to minors. The bill would establish a graduated schedule of creditable penalties for illegal sales so that store owners and employees face a punishment that is proportional to the violation. The proposed law would rely primarily on civil penalties to avoid the time delays and costs of the court system, but allow use of local courts to assess fines similar to traffic enforcement. The bill would ban the use of vending machines to dispense cigarettes. Mr. Chairman, it is to your credit that many of the essential features of the model law have been incorporated into your bill. However, we do not agree that we should, at this time, re require states to enact these reforms or lose all funds under the Alcohol, Drug Abuse, and Mental Health Block Grant. There are several reasons. First, we do not want to jeopardize the vital program supported by the Adam Haw Block Grant. Realistically, a few states may have entrenched interest that could prevent immediate passage of reasonable enforcement laws, despite the threatened loss of vital funds. Second, we are still learning. While our model law specifications are as good as we can make them now, a year or two of state experience may lead to new and better ideas. We would not want to freeze the nation, the nation prematurely into our model. Third, we believe the states will act responsibly in this, an area of traditional state authority. Having explore, explained why we would oppose immediate enactment of the penalty provisions included in H.R. 5041, Mr. Chairman, let me assure you that we agree with the possible need to consider further federal action. We would simply defer consideration and then appraise straight and state and local actions to determine if stronger measures are needed. I would like to comment on one other focus of the bill, the provisions related to warning labels. Warning labels are a vital part of our efforts to reduce smoking. They can serve as a recurring reminder that tobacco kills. However, warnings must be seen and read to be effective. Current labeling, both on product packages and in advertisements, is inadequate 
and warrants reform. It is clear that the current warning labels for packages, printed advertisements, and billboards are too small and are even illegible in some cases. This is a problem that Secretary Sullivan has been concerned about. Indeed, at the Senate Finance Committee hearing on tobacco in May, the Secretary said that the Surgeon General's tobacco warnings in many advertisements are too small. Thank you very much for that testimony. The rest of it, uh, I know you don't have much more, but the rest of it will all be in the record. We're going to have to, unfortunately for all the witnesses, stay very close to this five-minute time period in order to complete the... Uh, testified that vending machines are responsible for 16 percent of the cigarette sales to minors. Now, is it reasonable to assume that the reason that this percentage isn't higher is that minors have an easy time to buy cigarettes from regular retail outlets? I think that'd be a natural assumption to make. As we talked to the, to the teenagers, uh, we found uh, no difficulty whatsoever on their part in, a, in, in order to, to buy these, uh, buy cigarettes. And that's also been um, uh, 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 verified by other studies that are uh, uh, available to us today. Is the, is the conclusion of your study that even though some states have laws saying cigarettes shouldn't be sold to minors, that those laws are by and large just not effective in stopping minors from getting cigarettes? That's correct. Those laws are not enforced today and therefore they're not effective. And the way most minors buy cigarettes is how? They go to the store and uh, ask the uh, clerk uh, for a pack, and, and they buy them that way. The, uh, Dr. Mason, uh, the administration is suggesting to us uh, a model bill for the states to uh, try to discourage uh, cigarette smoking. And uh, let me ask you, in the context of other model legislation, for example, the drunk driving laws, we have uh, requirements that the states, in fact, raise the drinking age to 21 as a condition for getting certain federal funds. We could leave it just at their discretion. We do allow them some discretion, but they obviously have a serious sanction if they don't adopt those laws. Do you think we ought to have some kind of sanction to the states if they don't adopt this model law? Well, Mr. Chairman, as I said in my testimony, we have serious reservations about the approach of linking state receipt of drug and mental health and alcohol funds to this law. Mm -hmm. so, and I said that if some states are slow for a number of reasons, then they, they end up with no law to suppress the sale of tobacco to youngsters and no federal funds for drug abuse prevention. And we would rather find incentives if it was felt that a federal approach was needed rather than depriving them if they don't pass the law of, of other vitally needed funds and programs. Yeah. You feel those sanctions would be counterproductive? We feel that, that holding them hostage in this kind of a disincentive, it would be counterproductive. So if we're going to do something to push them, we should look for other alternatives? That's right. And, mm -hmm. and we would suggest that you wait and see if the states don't enact laws on their own. Several years ago, uh, you know, we tried to move toward the drinking age. Uh, do you consider it important as a health, public health measure that uh, we try to get state laws to prohibit and effectively stop the sale of tobacco to minors? Absolutely. A famous American recently said, it's a long quote, but I'd like to read it, through the association of athletics and tobacco, young people may be tempted to smoke an athlete or a sports figure should not allow his or her good name, hard-earned image, or integrity to be exploited to push a product which, when used as intended, causes disease, disability, and death. I'm especially concerned about the dangerous mixed message sent when sporting events are sponsored by the tobacco industry. Exercise and athletic competition are healthy activities when the tobacco industry sponsors an event in order to push their deadly product they're trading on the health, the prestige, and the image of the athlete to barter a product that will kill the user. The sponsorship itself uses the vigor and energy of athletes as a subtle but incorrect and dishonest message that smoking can be compatible with good health, which it is not." End of quote. Uh, these sound like the views of a man who would support legislation prohibiting tobacco sponsorship of sporting events like professional women's tennis. 
Uh, I don't know if you know who made those statements. Those were, rather than ask you to guess, made by uh, the Secretary, Lou Sullivan, Secretary of Health and Human Services. Do you know whether he and whether you would support prohibiting tobacco sponsorship of sports? Secretary Sullivan, as you have said, has specifically identified and addressed the conflicts of having tobacco companies sponsor professional sporting events. And he has met with some of these groups and personally urged that they become responsible uh, for, for not associating athletic and professional sponsorships with tobacco. Athletics, athletes themselves and professional organizations should bring their influence and example to bear as well. And we want to continue this approach and give organization and individuals a chance to start acting more responsibly before using more drastic measures. If those don't work, then, then I think one has to go to additional steps. Thank you very much. Mr. Blinding. Dr. Mason, studies have shown that countries like Norway, where tobacco advertising ban was instituted in 1975, have higher teen smoking rates than countries with less stringent advertising regulations. This leads me to believe that despite the advertising restrictions recommended in this legislation, some kids will still smoke. What makes you think it will be any different here? Mr. Bliley, I think the tobacco companies in the United States are clearly a well aware of the effectiveness of tobacco advertising, and that's why they target billions of dollars to our younger age groups and adolescents. Uh, I can't say about the promotional enterprises in Norway, but here in the United States it is clear that advertising is promoting smoking among our young people and adolescents, and if that could be reduced, that targeting, it would have make serious inroads upon taking up this habit and this addicting behavior early in life. Studies that I've seen show that uh, only 3% of young people uh, claim that they took up smoking, those that smoke, uh, because of advertising. Uh, the rest uh, said it was peer pressure or uh, observing their parents or, or other adults. Uh, yet uh, we see the World Health Study that did 16 countries that showed that uh, uh, doing away with advertising had no effect on, on young people. Yet uh, in the last 10 years, uh, the number of smokers among children, uh, young people or high school seniors has dropped from 29 million to 19 million. So apparently, uh, in spite of advertising that it, that it works, I would also point out to you that for each point of uh, brand preference switch, it represents some $400 million. So that's a pretty potent reason why someone would advertise. Uh, in 1988, uh, Dr. Mason, uh, the Surgeon General report, uh, re General's report states that nicotine, was, which is found in cigarettes and other tobacco products, is addictive. Yet the 1989 Surgeon General's report stated that the smoking rate has dropped from 40 percent to 29 percent. How did so many people quit smoking if it's addictive? We have people in the United States uh, getting off of the alcohol habit. Uh, uh, we know that through uh, AAA and other ways you can uh, stop uh, abusing alcohol. Uh, people are getting off of cocaine, crack, heroin, and other drugs uh, through tra treatment and, and a lot of self-will and discipline. And the same thing obviously is happening with tobacco. But we have to recognize as a nation that the addiction to tobacco, whether it's chewing or snuffing or smoking, is as strong as any other of these addictions. And for many people, they have a hard time breaking the habit. And the tobacco industry knows, and we saw the uh, the, the posters that were put up by Mr. Whitaker, that if you can get enough boys to believe that they become smooth characters, if they just smoke, that they get addicted to that substance and some later will be able to break that addiction. But many will find it very, very difficult. We it, should be trying to protect our young 
boys and our young girls uh, from ever establishing that kind of a destructive, addicting habit. Dr. Mason, is, is the percentage of people who get off of cocaine and uh, other narcotics as great as, as the percentage of people here who have, uh, who have given up smoking? I don't have the exact figures, but I think if we looked at comparable groups of people, comparable socioeconomic, uh, comparable um, comorbidities that you would find that the, the difficulties with uh, tobacco are every bit as great as difficulties with other illegal drugs in the United States. Would you check your records and see if you do have any percentages, figures, and if so, sum submit them for the record? I would be happy to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Blatty. Mr. Sinan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a couple of questions, if I could, Mr. Dr. Mason. We don't permit the uh, free distribution of alcoholic beverages. Do you support the prohibition uh, on the distribution of free tobacco products? That, that's exactly, uh, that's very true. And uh, I want mm -hmm. you to know that the Secretary and I strongly oppose distribution of free samples of any tobacco product to minors. And the model state law that we have proposed and distributed contains a provision which makes distribution of free tobacco products to young people uh, illegal. Well, Dr. Mason, as you know, we have a very difficult type, uh, time stopping our youth from even taking up the habit. And I think part of it is because uh, we can't stop the demand uh, for these cigarettes by adolescents. You know, I was shocked to learn that we still have companies that are manufacturing candy cigarettes and candy cigars. Uh, do you support uh, the parts of this legislation uh, that would prohibit the sale of these kind of candy cigarettes in order to try to stop the dangerous message that it sends to four and five and six year old kids? Mr. Siner, I agree with you that uh, that's despicable to use a, a message such as a candy product uh, to make people think that tobacco use is good and smooth and, and acceptable. Uh, where we might differ is how we would do away with that. I would hope that uh, by talking to manufacturers of candy, uh, by other groups that uh, sell and dispense candies, that we could bring this about without uh, uh, going the, uh, uh, the legislative route. But if uh, we were unsuccessful in doing that and bringing that about in short order, then one would have to try other approaches. Dr. Mason, let me ask you one final question. As you know, there's a growing concern in this country in improving the approach of primary prevention to drug abuse. Uh, to what extent do you all believe that the prevention of cigarette smoking by adolescents can reduce the risk of them using things like alcohol, marijuana, and other uh, drugs? Well, I think this nation has, uh, has need to come to grips with uh, the knowledge that both tobacco and alcohol are clearly gateway substances into marijuana, into cocaine, into crack, and to other illegal drugs. Very few people go directly from non-addiction directly into the illegal drugs. They go through the gateway of tobacco addiction and alcohol addiction. One final question, back to the thing on the candies. You said you wanted to start discussions with the candy, uh, candy manufacturers. Have you done that in the administration? There, there have letters uh, have gone out not only to, to candy manufacturers, but the baseball cards that often do some promotion as well. And uh, we're making an attempt to interact with those groups and see if we can't convince them that it would be in their own best interest, uh, as well as morally and socially, in the best interest of the company to back away from those kind of promotions. Well, Dr. Mason, how long should Congress give you to be successful in that or intervene ourselves? Well, it's hard to, to come up with a specific time frame, but I would think one or two years. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Thank you, Mr. Sinai. Mr. Whitaker? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Dr. Mason, for your very supportive testimony. I would like to uh, devote the majority of my questions to exploring what I might feel would be your statutory authority to possibly pursue this, uh, our concerns more aggressively than what you have. Uh, in particular, Dr. Mason, in 1984 and 1986, Congress enacted legislation requiring cigarettes and smokeless tobacco companies to submit lists of chemical ingredients used manufacturing uh, their products. Can you tell us the purpose of those laws? 
The law was uh, enacted to identify substances that are added to or mixed with uh, uh, naturally grown tobacco to enhance the flavor, the taste, uh, the attractiveness uh, of uh, the tobacco that finally was dispensed either as snuff or uh, as chewing tobacco or smoking tobacco, and it was to identify uh, additives that uh, uh, might, uh, I guess, increase the risk to the uh, user of the product uh, in, in the context of ill health. In other words, it was to identify those products that were either known carcinogens or co-carcinogens. Those substances were known to be toxic or hazardous to the health. Uh, in the hope, I would suggest, Dr. Mason, that you would make that knowledge available to the consuming public. The legislation, as I understand it, was so crafted that uh, the tobacco companies would uh, provide a list of additives uh, and ingredients, uh, but there was uh, a great deal of confidential, uh, proprietary confidentiality with regard to the handling of those lists, and that was part of the legislation that was passed, that that would be held in confidence. So it's an accurate statement that is it, is, it is a facade for the tobacco proponents to identify the submission of these lists as full disclosure, when they very well know that the very enactment of the law that provided for the submitting of that list also guaranteed the confidentiality and the fact that that information could not be given over to the public. Well, I, I can't really uh, speak on the in, uh, intentions or, or, or things of that nature, but, but certainly it does not provide a way for this to be shared uh, uh, generally. Dr. Mason, I understand that you have yet to receive any ingredient list from smokeless tobacco manufacturers. Can you tell the subcommittee what actions the department has taken to date to alert the public about the presence of possible carcinogens and other toxic ingredients contained in cigarettes? We feel, uh, Mr. Whitaker, that tobacco is the real culprit. It is lethal, and we need to direct our resources fully to addressing smoking and chewing. Regulating ingredients or toxins added to tobacco misses the point. Nothing they put in can do more harm than the tobacco itself. The real poison is tobacco, and we really don't want to be diverted from that mission. Well, I recognize your dilemma, but you also are aware that down through the decades, uh, the tobacco lobby has been eminently successful in crafting legislation meant to protect the consuming public or American public from having much jurisdiction over tobacco itself. And those of us that are in either the medical field or have public responsibility that are trying to address this dilemma naturally will take advantage or look for opportunities to achieve a reduction in the detrimental health effects through whatever other means we have. And I would suggest that going after the ingredient aspect and letting the public know of the toxicity of some of these ingredients is a legitimate and a worthwhile endeavor. And I would further suggest that the department could be more helpful. Rather than to say that tobacco in general is bad and thus you are neglecting the opportunities you have available to specifically look at these additives, uh, you're, letting, you're letting an opportunity pass you by. Do you agree with that? Uh, I really appreciate your urging us to uh, look at this more fully and more completely, but uh, I really do want to make the point that uh, tobacco, tobacco products or additives can't be somehow regulated to make tobacco safe. And we'll be happy to, to give this further look, but I, I just want to make the point that, that it is tobacco per se, and we don't want to... Uh, uh, the people of this nation to feel that somehow we can do something with tobacco, we can remove some ingredient. Uh, there are over 4,000 chemicals in tars that uh, are emitted in the process of uh, uh, burning uh, tobacco or chewing tobacco that a person is exposed to. And adding other things foreign to tobacco cannot really significantly increase the risk of those 4,000 uh, substances that are already there. Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sikorsky. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. In April this year, uh, Dr. Mason, you pre presented a keynote address at the 7th World uh, Conference on Tobacco and Health in Perth, Australia. 
you were appearing in place of Secretary Sullivan, who was unable to attend, and in your remarks you expressed strong criticism of the U.S. tobacco companies' marketing practices in less developed nations. In fact, uh, some of the language uh, was beyond strong. It was uh, incredibly strong. Now, now there's some confusion about your uh, uh, remarks and the extent with which they reflect your views, the views of the department, the, view, the views of Secretary Sullivan and the administration. <laughs> Upon your return from Perth, Dr. Sullivan was asked about your remarks and commented that the export marketing practices of U.S. tobacco companies overseas was not a health issue. He insisted it was a trade issue and by implication not an issue in which his department was concerned. Dr. Sullivan subsequently wrote the, the subcommittee stating that in the future the department's willingness to discuss health concerns of smoking would be limited to its effect, quote, on our citizens, end of quote. In making your presentation in Perth, uh, did you misunderstand Secretary Sullivan's views on the subject or did the Secretary's views change upon your return? I don't believe that uh, there has been any significant change in anyone's views. Uh, uh, the Secretary and I believe that tobacco is an equal opportunity killer. It's lethal to whoever uses it, uh, wherever they may live, in whatever nation. Uh, it's the leading cause of preventable death in the United States and some other countries. And if uh, trends continue in many third world countries, it'll become their leading cause of death. And our administration, including the Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Trade representative stands ready to assist other countries with smoking cessation programs. Uh, our technical assistance is available. We'll support and encourage any nation wishing to promote anti-tobacco efforts, including advertising. And we hope that the message that the United States of America is given about the lethal and harmful effects of tobacco will be picked up and used uh, throughout the world. And uh, so I, I think that we're moving along in a way that uh, will allow the department to, uh, to encourage nations, to work with nations, to enact whatever provisions they need. You uh, stand by your statement in Perth. You stand yes. by your statement in Perth. Yes. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sikorsky. Mr. Denimer. Morning, Dr. Mason. Uh, you're uh, working in HHS, I understand. Is that right? That's you're, correct. And are you appearing today representing the views of HHS or the views of Dr. Mason? I'm here representing the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, no. Mr. Dannemeyer. No, you're speaking as an official representative for HHS then? That's correct. <clears throat> does, uh, does HHS support 5041? Did they what? Does HHS support 5041? I, as I said in my prepared testimony, there are provisions of the bill that we cannot support. We certainly support the, uh, the warning provisions. Uh, that we uh, have I mean a little more precise now. If the bill that is before the committee comes to the floor of the House, with section 9 in it or another section which requires states as a condition of receiving federal money to do certain things, would HHS support the bill in that form? No, for the reasons that I've already given. We feel that this is a disincentive and could leave some states with neither a smoking law that would protect youth and minors and no funds for drug abuse activities. Uh, now, now I notice that uh, just have um, are there other food products or products that are used in this country uh, that we require warning labels on besides tobacco? Uh, I cannot think of any right now. I, I don't want to say no because uh, I'd want yeah. to look at that uh, much more carefully. Yeah. Now, notice on the table where you're sitting there, there's a, uh, some water, a bucket of water. You see that? Um, 
Annually, we will have reported to CDC in Atlanta, Georgia, from states of the union that certain numbers of people are made ill from the consumption of water because it's contaminated with salmonella. Isn't that correct? Salmon, uh, any water, if uh, if it hasn't been uh, yeah. properly treated and and uh, de delivered to the individual, uh, could be a health hazard. That's yeah. correct. But when it's properly yeah. chlorinated and gone through filtration and other uh, uh, is systems, there uh, is there a warning label on that uh, container? I can't see one from here. Uh, I don't see one either. And uh, if we sometimes as consumers in America can be made ill from drinking water because on occasion it may be contaminated, policy-wise, why don't we have a law requiring that we label containers of water to advise consumers? Mr. Dannemeyer, if I understand the direction you're taking, uh, I think this is a very, very poor simile. Tobacco is lethal. It kills 390,000 Americans every year, a thousand a day. Now we and, have, and it now has wait a no minute. other now use wait a minute. other than, uh, than we, bringing people to a, a state of disease. We, this water is life-giving. We would die without it. But sometimes it makes us ill. Sometimes automobiles make us ill. Sometimes yeah. medicines. We can take too much salt, but salt and medicines and automobiles and airplanes aren't intended to kill us. It's a far different crime now we have, than a cigarette. Uh, current law requires that cigarettes have a warning label on them, doesn't that right? I, I, I'm glad that it does. Yeah. And uh, are there, is there any other product in our society that we require that there be a restriction on uh, advertising? You remember when uh, uh, we were both small. There was a skull and a crossbones on uh, various uh, products that came in bottles or packages to warn us that they kill us. I think it's been traditional in the United States to warn both on the package and in advertising that uh, this product, if not used as intended, uh, can be lethal. And that's been part of the American culture as far back as I can remember. I don't see anything consistent about labeling a lethal substance uh, on the package itself and then in advertising uh, saying uh, that this can kill, uh, this can addict, uh, this can maim unborn babies. Uh, I think that's entirely consistent with the American tradition. I noticed in the questions by my colleague, Mr. Bliley, he made reference to the uh, analysis of what has been the result in people in Norway to the ban on advertising. And I'm not sure you answered that question. If, if banning advertising in Norway has not been successful in reducing the number of teenagers that have begun smoking, what reason do we have to believe that banning advertising in the United States will have that effect? I'm not familiar with all of the circumstances. Uh, in I realize the Norwegians Norway. read Norwegian and we but, uh, speak in English here, but that's not the distinction. Although you and I may differ, I believe that experts in the field of marketing and uh, even if one looks at the amount of money that's going into promoting tobacco, I think it leads one conclusively to the clear conclusion that advertising creates a climate it creates a milieu, it creates a situation where our young men and our young women are enticed to take up this lethal habit. There's no question about it in terms of science in the United States. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Danimar and Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Dr. Mason, there have been several studies that show that 90 to 95 percent of Americans are aware of general and specific health charges against smoking. Is there any evidence that minorities and women are less informed about these health concerns than other Americans? Surveys that uh, have been carried out show that uh, there is a difference in uh, information and knowledge about the uh, lethal effects of tobacco in particularly certain minority populations. And I'm not s certain that it's related as much uh, to being a minority as it is to education levels and information and things of that nature. And we also know that a lot of the advertising has been targeted specifically towards certain minority and socioeconomic groups. Uh, so the countervalent uh, 
promotion of tobacco products has not been equal and for that reason that even though they may have read in various other places that tobacco is harmful, the, uh, the targeting of uh, media to certain populations may lead them to have doubts in their minds that they would not otherwise have uh, had that targeting not been carried out. Let me ask you this. Um, from where you sit, what you know at this time, information that's been collected, what would you recommend? You indicate you do not support 5041. What do you recommend? Well, first of all, I would recommend strongly that we do something about the warning labels to make them larger, more legible, more direct, more clear. That becomes the the basis uh, of everyone that sees an advertisement, uh, you know, when we go to a bank to borrow money, there has to be full disclosure about the lifetime effect of that borrowing, what it's going to cost. And this should also be true in looking at a tobacco package or billboard or a poster or anything else. There should be truth in labeling and the individual should know the full consequences of using that product. So I, I, that's where I would start. Secondly, I would begin to, to create what Secretary Sullivan has called a, a uh, culture of character, uh, a new uh, milieu where uh, smoking is no longer perceived to be glamorous, to be sexy, to be slick, uh, to be the basis for success. And I think in this country somehow our young people have come away with the position that, that to succeed and to get ahead and to to make it, uh, uh, at least in the teenage years and early 20s, uh, if you don't use tobacco, uh, there's something wrong with you. So that whole milieu of culture needs to be uh, changed. Uh, there, there are a number of things that could be done, but if we could accomplish those two, I think we would have come a long way. Well, uh, for, let me just say, first of all, thank you for being very cautious about it in terms of you know, what you feel that needs to be done because that troubles me sometimes that uh, you know, we jump and we do. We need to make certain that whatever we're going to do is something that's, that works, you know, not just sort of out of emotions to sort of move to do things. And I'm very concerned about that. As I said on the clean air bill, you know, uh, I think that we want to make certain that we have clean air, and clean air is very important. And I think that we know it's uh, healthy, and uh, we know that, uh, uh, that air, dirty, dirty air will actually kill. We also know that starvation will kill. Uh, and so it's a question is what one would like to die by, you know, so I think that we have to have a balance here. You know, uh, if you're going to starve to death and no jobs and all of that, I think that we have to look at all these things and put it in the proper perspective. So uh, I'm concerned about uh, a one-way track. So I think that uh, you're being very cautious to me, uh, I think is very important. And uh, I'd also like to thank the chairman for, you know, making this opportunity possible for, for us to have the kind of dialogue that's necessary, I think, to do the right thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Town. Uh, Mr. Nielsen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Neal indicated that he started to smoke when he was a teenager because of peer pressure had nothing to do with advertising. Do you have any studies that uh, indicate why people start smoking? Is it because of advertising? Is it because of peer pressure? Are there any studies that you know about which would give us the information there? Uh, there are a number of studies that have been carried out, and uh, if you would like, I would be happy to submit them for the record. But certainly peer pressure is, is significant uh, uh, in that area. Uh, heroes, uh, who one looks up to and admires, uh, uh, plays a role in that. Uh, the climate that I've already mentioned, but if uh, you would like, I'd be happy to submit for the record uh, some of these studies that have been carried out. I'd appreciate it. It's very important because if it is peer pressure primarily, then what we do with advertising won't have as much impact as it would otherwise. Well, I'm not sure about that because I think advertising creates part of that culture in which uh, peer pressure flourishes. I don't think you can separate advertising from peer pressure. I think there's a direct correlation and relationship. Now, you mentioned that uh, the tobacco industry has uh, gotten the idea of the macho and, and be cool and so forth, and it's important to, to get along with people to smoke and so forth. Uh, the liquor industry has often said in their ads, uh, say when to say when, or when to say when, and don't drive when you drink, this, this type of thing. They make some public service announcements at various times. To your information, has the tobacco industry ever made its public service announcement to indicate that there are times when you shouldn't smoke or that you should not smoke at all? I'm not aware of any. No public service announcements? Uh, not that I know of. 
The speech you made uh, in answer to uh, Reverend Sikorsky was a speech that if ca carried on public service would have, have some impact, but they don't do that. Not that I know of. Should they? I like uh, the way uh, California has moved with Proposition uh, 99. I think uh, that's something that both the Secretary and I endorse, and this provides uh, a way for someone uh, to counteract the ads that are paid for by the tobacco companies. Okay, let me ask another question. As I recall, the, uh, the uh, bill in 1984 on the ingredient list, and the question there was not whether they should be confidential or not. The question is, would they be revealing trade secrets? In other words, if they gave the precise exact formulation of their cigarettes, that would reveal to uh, one company what the other company is doing, and I think that's right to It was the proprietary uh, so, part of so it. So the confidentiality had more to do with pr protection of their proprietary formulas rather than to uh, keep it from the public, wasn't it? But I think that's correct. So uh, Representative Whitaker was leading you on just a bit there, it seems to me. Uh, I think that was a good... I'll yield to the gentleman for a response if he wants to. <laughs> well, I'd just suggest that uh, that's one aspect of looking at it for my good colleague from uh, Utah. But the truth of the matter is, is they've got that information and they could be more uh, forthcoming with it. Uh, uh, the reason that I, I oppose making making that public at the time, and I got some criticism at home. If you know my district, you know why I got criticism in my district. But I felt that trade secrets should not be revealed. I felt a list in order of rank, and like every other public does, was fine. I think that should be public. I think a confidential list to you is fine, but I didn't think it should be public. Now let me ask about sponsorship of the Future Farmers of America. I had some visit me they, yesterday, 4-H, uh, uh, leadership conferences that come back to Washington. The tobacco industry sponsors a good many of these kinds of things. This bill would make those pro uh, prohibited. What about some subsidiaries of the tobacco companies, such as Del Monte or uh, Nabisco, Kraft, 7-Up used to be uh, owned by the tobacco company, Kentucky Fried Chicken used to be owned by the tobacco company. Could they, these subsidiaries, sponsor these activities under the bill as far as you understand it? Well, in meetings that the Secretary and I have had with uh uh, various groups that have uh, relied upon tobacco company sponsorship in the past, we have strongly encouraged and suggested that they look for other sponsors and other sponsors but, uh, but what about, exist and are out there. But what about Del Monte? They produce nice vegetables and uh, healthy, uh, as far as I know, uh, very well qualified in the field. Uh, what if they sponsored an FFA project? Would that be illegal under the terms of the, of the bill? Uh, you'd have to ask the sponsor. Uh, gentlemen, gentlemen would yield. yield. Because it makes a difference uh, to me how far do we carry this. Yeah. Yes. No, uh, the gentleman would be incorrect if he thought it would go further in the corporate uh, structure. The provisions of the bill say explicitly the tobacco product itself would not be the sponsor. And not even the company, not R.J. Reynolds itself, but uh, the use of the logo and the tobacco as the sponsor. But you wouldn't object to, say, Del Monte sponsoring something in California because that's a fine company in California? <laughs> Even if they were in uh, Utah, they could go ahead and support. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Dr. Rowland? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm gonna, I'd like to conduct a sort of an unscientific poll here if I could. I'd like for everyone in the audience who smoked or ever smoked to raise their hand. Thank you very much. I'd like for you to raise your hand if you started smoking because of an advertisement you saw. Mr. Chairman, let the record show that probably 50 or 60 people raised their hand, but not one hand was raised in response to the second question. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen yield, gentlemen, yield this time. How many of the people who raised your hand that you smoke are here representing the tobacco industry? <laughs> <laughs> let the record show one person. <laughs> let the record show they're not under oath. Thank you. <laughs> Let the record show you didn't swear them in. <laughs> I'm not going to swear them out either. Thank, thank you very much, um, both of you, for your testimony. We appreciate uh, what you had to say to us, and we'll look forward to working with you on this legislation. We have two things. There's a tape we want to show before the testimony. Okay. Our next witness is represent a variety of public health organizations in support of the legislation. Ken Kyle is Director of Public Issues for the Canadian Cancer Society. 
William Cahan is a cancer physician at Memorial Sloan Kettering San Cancer Center in New York City. Holly Atkinson is a physician affiliated with the American Heart Association. And Alberta Tinsley Williams is a Wayne County Commissioner in Detroit, Michigan. Mark Green is Commissioner of the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs. I want to welcome you all to this hearing. that you're here at our subcommittee hearing this morning, your prepared statements will be in the record in full. What we'd like to ask of each of you is to uh, limit your oral presentation to no more than five minutes. Let me uh, mention the fact that we had originally invited Mr. Carl Lewis, U.S. gold medal Olympian in the 84 and 88 Olympics to be with us. Unfortunately, he was unable to attend due to a European track competition. He did, however, take time to make a videotaped statement which we'd like to have uh, presented to us at this time. Very sensitive. 
The rules are often considered as to the demand for a man and his genius for his woman are false and very separate role models. Cigarettes do not make macho and they definitely do not have the tendency. Cigarette models are not heroes and cigarette ads send the wrong message to our kids and we must eliminate these images. We must do away with these false role models. I want to say to everyone in America, and especially our children, if you don't smoke or chew tobacco, don't start. You can't smoke and be an athlete too. In fact, there's just no future in smoking. If you already use tobacco, I urge you, please, think hard about what you're doing to your body and do everything in your health to stop as soon as possible. Please, stop now. Dr. Cahan, why don't we start with you, if we might, and then we'll hear from Mr. Kyle. Yes. You and I haven't seen Could each you uh, speak right into the microphone, sir? You and I haven't seen each other for seven years because it was at that time we were testifying on behalf of changing the warning labels on cigarettes. I'm glad to say that we were successful. We changed for what we thought was a wrist slap of a warning that the Surgeon General has con considered that smoking was a dangerous to your health to being disease specific in the labels that we have. I think the time has come to implement those and make them even more, ex it may make, make them more emphatic. But let me tell you something, as I listen to all the testimony, I see everybody around here, let me tell you, I left my hospital this morning having made rounds. My hospital is Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, the first cancer hospital in America and one of its most prestigious. 30% of our adult population would not be there had they not smoked. We talk about cancer of the lung, but you must not forget oral cavity, larynx, esophagus, pancreas, urinary bladder, and even cancer of the cervix. You have to see these tragedies face to face to understand why all conversations to the contrary, or all pussyfooting that we see around such a subject is absolutely reprehensible. These tragedies have struck congressmen, senators, presidents. And you must not dodge the issue, the human element here, while trying to find certain little refinements in the way you're tracking this. Let me just show you something of the more human elements here. This is an x-ray of a patient of mine, a 52-year-old wife, mother, grandmother, who started smoking at 15, and she was 52, at the time this was taken. She had developed a cigarette cough 10 years before this x-ray and her family pleaded with her to quit smoking, but she used the usual dodges. I can't possibly do it, or if I do, I'm going to put on weight. A week before this x-ray, she coughed up blood. She and her family brought this x-ray to me for consultation as I'm a lung cancer surgeon. And of course, as you can see, the, on your right is a clear left lung with a little hard shadow, you can see indenting it. But, but on the right, you see a huge shadow, and that unfortunately was an inoperable lung cancer, and she died four months later. She said as she looked at that shadow, my God, is that mine? And why didn't I listen to them? This is the kind of a statement I hear over and over again, those patients who have been afflicted with cancer. Let me say quickly, that she is an element, of course, that has been mentioned. She is a single instance of a woman, a woman lung cancer patient, and there's an extraordinarily precipitous rise in the incidence of that in women. She is somebody who couldn't give it up because she was addicted. She was somebody who, frankly, died of that particular addiction. Now, she also started at 15. The present age when kids start is down around 10, 11, and 12. And as a factor that is often overlooked by people considering this, is that young, growing tissues are much more susceptible to carcinogens than adult ones. And almost all smokers begin as young children. Remember that. Not only is it because they are, they are growing in that particular way, but because they are starting at a younger age, we can anticipate that there's going to be a larger epidemic of lung cancer and other cancer related, smoking related cancers, as well as it appearing younger than the present generation. So that is one point to be made strongly to you. The second thing is that we have the specimens that I'd like to show you. Can we put those up? 
This one specimen, no, the other one, if you don't. This is a specimen of an adult lung of a non-smoker. As you can see, it has certain black specks about it, which are those which appear sometimes where you inhale dust over a period of a lifetime. I think you can take and put the other one up. As the next, the next specimen you'll see was of a two or three pack a day smoker, and you'll see the difference immediately of the deposition of huge amounts of cigarette tar. You can see at one side to the right a blister looking uh, structure called bullous emphysema that is frequently an accompaniment of heavy smoking. Now these tars are being deposited in children as they begin to smoke. Three to five thousand children are lighting up every day for the first time in America. We talk about oil spills, we worry about the effect on the wildlife of oil spills, the, the soiling of the feathers of birds. Let us think about the soiling of these children's lungs with, that they eventually will come to look like that. About addiction there can be no doubt. The use of the word habit should be not applied to cigarette smoking anymore than it is to cocaine. Cocaine is not an a habit, it's an addiction. If you have any question about it being that, come to my hospital where you see people who have tracheostomies or one lung removed smoking actually through a hole in their windpipe. This is a form of child abuse and the cigarette companies of course are the prime instigators of this with their innuendos, their artful dodging and their cynical approach to this whole subject of trying to replace non-smokers with their ads. As far as labels are concerned, all of you are old enough to remember tincture of iodine. Tincture of iodine labels, I'm sure you all remember, had a skull and a crossbone and the word poison. Here are some here. If a label is strong enough, it can be remembered the rest of your life, and I'm sure you all remember that particular bottle. Thank you very much, Mr. Cahill. May I say one more thing? The word legal has been used frequently here, that this is a legal industry. There's a great difference, as you congressmen will know, between legal and moral. It is legal for the Ku Klux Klan to assemble. It is legal for neo-Nazi organizations to assemble. But it is not a moral thing. Thank you very much. Mr. Kyle. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, it's a real pleasure to be a guest in your country today. I work for the uh, Canadian Cancer Society, which is very similar to the American Cancer Society. We're the largest health charity in Canada. We uh, receive no uh, government funding. After sitting here this morning, I can say that the same arguments that are being used in the U.S. to stop controls and advertising in, uh, of tobacco were heard in Canada, such as tobacco does not cause disease and, and tobacco advertising is only for brand switching. The government of Canada, led by the Conservative Party, did not buy this, and with all party support, Parliament banned tobacco advertising and promotion in 1988. Tobacco was the only consumer product that uh, kills when used precisely as the manufacturer intends. I'm here today to tell you that controls on tobacco advertising and promotion work, and in my testimony you'll see that, that sales of cigarettes in Canada are, are dropping like a stone. Uh, those opposed to the uh, legislation in Canada claimed that there was universal knowledge of the effects of tobacco smoking, and we decided to look into this. The Cancer Society uh, did a Gallup poll and asked Canadians about the perceived health hazards related to smoking. The research data showed clearly that Canadians dramatically underestimate the severe health risks of cigarette smoking. Clearly, Canadians did not have the health information necessary to make informed decisions about the use of tobacco products. Now, the the act has been in since 1988. The uh, international tobacco industry has challenged the act in the courts, and the federal government has been defending the law in court. Central to its position is that eliminating tobacco product advertising is a reasonable limitation on freedom of speech as provided for in Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Many formerly secret marketing documents of Canada's tobacco companies are now on the public record ha after having to be produced as evidence in the constitutional challenge. We suspected these things before, Mr. Chairman. Now the truth is out. From Imperial Tobacco's 1971 marketing plan, young smokers represent the major opportunity group for the cigarette industry. Uh, another marketing plan of Imperial Tobacco, uh, 
responding to the needs of the younger smokers. Uh, in, the 19, in the fiscal 1980 media plans of Imperial Tobacco, the target groups for advertising purposes for each brand were listed. For Players Filter, the target groups were listed as men, 12 to 17 years of age. Uh, in the Imperial Tobacco's 81 National Marketing Plan, they talked about uh, targeting to potential smokers. Uh, they, they said um, in uh, uh, RJR McDonald's testimony, Export, this is a brand of cigarettes in Canada, should continue to appeal to younger males who are sports oriented, drink beer, enjoy popular music, are most comfortable in blue jeans and t-shirts. However, to maintain our current franchise and attract lap smokers, uh, this, they were going after lap smokers. Uh, it's, it's, it's clear that cigarette companies have been going after kids, uh, former smokers and potential smokers. From another one, um, Perhaps for the first time, the mandate under consideration is not limited simply to maximizing at Imperial Tobacco limited franchises. It is now to include as well serious attempts to combat those forces aligned in an attempt to significantly diminish the size of the tobacco marketing market in Canada. Project Pearl is directed at expanding the market or at least forestalling its decline. It also looked at the needs of smokers specifically. Unmet needs of smokers that could be satisfied by newer modified products. Products which could delay the quitting process are pursued. It should be noted that the international tobacco industry has always maintained that it is not trying to expand the market or get people to start smoking or delay smokers from leaving the market. Canada has banned advertising in magazines and newspapers. Uh, all signs and billboards will be banned by the first of next year. Uh, during the phase-out period, every billboard advertising cigarettes was required to uh, display the following health warning. Smoking causes lung cancer, emphysema and heart disease. And these warnings have to be at uh, twenty percent at the top of every billboard. Now on labeling, I've handed out copies to you of uh, what the current law is in Canada. Why are American companies, these are cigarettes uh, made in the USA, uh, why is there better uh, protection of uh, foreigners than there are of Americans? These are imported into Canada but of course they must comply with the uh, with the current legislation in Canada. The, the labeling Regulations have worked so well in Canada, the government has become very enthusiastic and they are going to increase the size of the labels from 20% of each side of the packet to 25% uh, and the government has announced that. This is what uh, some of these will uh, look like. I'll hand around the sheet uh, right here. I think I have copies for all the members of the committee. The current warnings are at the top and the new ones are here. And the announced legislation is that when you open a new cigarette po packet, up will pop a, a leaflet insert inside every cigarette package giving more detailed health information so every consumer will have sufficient uh, information to make an informed choice. And, and the smoking rates are going down much faster in Canada than the U.S. We unfortunately were much higher. They're just dropping very quickly and this legislation really does work. Thank you very much, Mr. Kyle. Ms. Atkinson? Chairman Waxman and members of the subcommittee, good morning. My name is Dr. Holly Atkinson. Today I appear before the subcommittee on behalf of three of the largest voluntary health organizations in the United States, the American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association, and the American Lung Association. Together, these organizations represent over five million dedicated volunteers, volunteers whose sole goal is to keep America healthy. As you know, Mr. Chairman, our organizations are in full support of your legislation. We believe, as you do, that we need to do much more in the area of education and regulation of tobacco products if we are going to have any significant impact on this nation's leading preventable cause of death. For the next several minutes, I want to concentrate on why your legislation is so desperately needed here in the United States. In spite of what the tobacco industry claims, and in spite of the fact that tobacco products account for approximately 390,000 deaths each year, these deadly products are the least regulated consumer products in the United States. In the almost three hours that we have uh, now been in this room, over 125 people will have died in the United States from cigarette smoking. They will continue to die unless the Congress of the United States acts and acts decisively. For too long, we've listened to the tobacco industry assure us that they don't want young people to smoke, that their advertising is aimed merely at brand switching, that they don't sample or market to children, that they adhere to a voluntary advertising and regulatory code adopted in 1964, and that somehow, because we in the health community are concerned about their targeting and marketing strategies aimed at women and minorities, that we are sexist and discriminatory. 
This is an industry which thinks that it can somehow buy the Constitution and the Bill of Rights with the profits made at the expense of our nation's health. And they convince us that it wants to protect our rights as individual citizens. One has to ask whose rights are being violated. Doesn't should an industry have a right to kill 390,000 Americans each year for the sake of billions of dollars in profits? Doesn't industry have a right to advertise, promote, and hand out samples of a product that is as addictive as cocaine and heroin? Doesn't industry have a right to target children with misleading advertising that suggests that the product will somehow make one more successful, sexually attractive, athletic, and sophisticated? Doesn't industry have a right to not disclose to the public what it is putting in its products in the form of potentially dangerous additives? I would say, doesn't the public have a right to be protected from these and other abuses by the tobacco industry? To borrow a phrase from one of the industry's own propaganda campaigns, we say, enough is enough. Contrary to the claims of the tobacco industry and its allies, the advertising, promotion, and marketing of tobacco products constitutes a health threat to the American public. These practices encourages young people to begin to smoke and to continue to use tobacco as well. We've seen it in the United States and now we're seeing it in Asian markets where the industry is demanding that it be allowed to advertise and promote its products to populations such as women and children who historically have not smoked. Mr. Chairman, I want to put today's hearing, your legislation, and the need to regulate tobacco products into perspective. In 1964, 25 years ago, Dr. Luther Terry released the first Surgeon General's report on smoking, implicating cigarette smoking as a cause of cancer. Fearful that tobacco products could undergo regulatory controls or even be banned, the industry did what it continues to do so well today. They put up a smoke screen by offering up a voluntary advertising, promotional, and sampling code designed to give the public and the government the impression that it's a responsible industry. For 25 years, there has been nothing but example after example of violations of this code. The code was purportedly developed to prohibit advertisements and sampling practices aimed at persons under the age of 21, as well as assuring that unproved and unsubstantiated health claims were not made. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record copies of the industry's code. In 1964, the industry readily and openly acknowledged that promotion efforts which related cigarette smoking to sophistication, sexual attraction, success, social prominence, and athletic ability were, in fact, advertisements which appealed to young people. They also stated that they would not use cartoon characters. The industry's code further required that advertisements should not suggest that a person's attractiveness, appearance, or good health is related to cigarette smoking. To this day, the tobacco industry has claimed that it has adhered to this unenforced code. Some of the ads you've seen here today clearly shows it is not, and we submit never will, until Congress acts to prevent this type of advertising. Yet the industry has repeatedly acknowledged to Congress and the American public that the themes contained in advertisements, such as those appearing here, are in fact aimed at young people and do encourage young people to smoke. To quote the former chairman of the Tobacco Institute, Edward Horrigan, at a hearing before Congress in 82, let me finish the quote, in 1964, we adopted a cigarette advertising code prohibiting advertising, marketing, and sampling directed at young people. Each company still adheres to the principle of this code. I think, Mr. Chairman, this longstanding admission of 25 years speaks for itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Atkinson. Uh, Let's hear next from uh, Ms. Williams. There's a button right on the base. Push it uh, forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, members of the subcommittee. My name is Alberta Tinsley Williams, and I am especially grateful to have this privilege to address you this morning. I am the founder of the Coalition Against Billboard Advertising of Alcohol and Tobacco, CABAT. Established in 1988, the coalition is dedicated to creating an awareness that visual images do teach, and that they have a lasting impact upon our children. We firmly believe that our inner cities across the United States should not be bombarded with billboards urging our children to smoke. As I've sat here this morning and listened to the testimony, I can see where the advertising of cigarettes and tobacco has caused, quote, a cold for America, a coal. 
If that is true, within the Hispanic community, it has caused the flu. And within my community, the Afro-American community, it has caused a severe case of pneumonia. I live in a community where tobacco ads constitute over 40 percent of all billboard advertising, where laundromats carry posters of cigarettes, where stores and gas stations openly sell individual cigarettes for 25 cents each. I'm here to tell you that poor people want to live. My community is vulnerable. We're vulnerable because we have a lower educational attainment. There is inadequate housing. There is a lack of quality health care facilities. There is an overwhelming sense of hopelessness in the inner city of America. All of these things combine, and yet when we walk out of our door, we see messages saying, alive with pleasure. Uh-uh. Earlier this spring, I'd like to tell you a story that occurred. Within two days in a suburban Detroit community, two young white boys, one age nine and one age 16, committed suicide. Column after column in our newspapers were filled with stories of why, why, why would these two boys kill themselves? That same week, a young black girl, age nine, died in a fire. In her attic, she burned to death. When her mother smelled the smoke, she asked her four-year-old son, where did she go? And he replied, she went up in the attic to smoke a cigarette. I want you to know that this particular article consisted of two paragraphs buried away in the back section of the paper. I believe that the influence of advertising is very, very effective. If we had $300 billion or $3 billion to counteract what they're doing, we could stop some of our children from smoking. I don't believe that House Bill 5041 is a panacea. No, it isn't. But when combined with education and prevention, we can make a difference. And I think that is our responsibility. I urge you, Mr. Chairman, to maintain your courage because as I've said here this morning, you are a courageous individual and many members of this, com this committee are also. I fully support House Bill 5041 and I look forward to joining you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. Green. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'm Mark Green, Commissioner of Consumer Affairs in New York City. In a month where so much press attention has been focused on one doctor's suicide machine, it seems only appropriate. Your subcommittee is debating here the use of the most widely sold suicide machine in America, to cigarettes. We are all familiar with the litany of grief caused by this product. Let me cite just three. This product takes 40 lives an hour in a country with a Congress that would probably ban a product, a new product, that took 40 lives a year. Second, Dr. Harold Freeman, the renowned head of the Harlem Hospital, cited smoking as the leading reason why men living today in Harlem have a lower life expectancy than men living today in Bangladesh. And third, one half of all the people in this room or country who have ever smoked, on average, started by age 13. All of which is why the Dinkins administration in New York City has prominently advocated a, a pro-health, a pro-child, a progressive, anti-nicotine agenda. Uh, the mayor signed a bill within the month banning the distribution of free samples. We are on the brink of getting a bill to ban cigarette vending machines. For the record, I'm submitting actions that I have taken on the mayor's behalf with the Federal Trade Commission, our Transit Authority, and R.J. Reynolds uh, to discourage the use of misleading ads. Now, if our society understandably spends billions to keep drugs from kids, how can we possibly allow the misleading advertising of a product that we know takes 10 times more lives than hard drugs? I think the question answers us itself, which is why our message to the tobacco firms is simple. Keep your ads off our kids. Now, the tobacco industry, of course, claims it does not target children for cigarette ads, and its 64 code does say that. Of course, this is the same industry that says there's no proven link between smoking and health. This is the same industry that says it spends $3.2 billion a year in advertising that, despite the laws of advertising, persuades no one to take up their product. Uh, when the Flat Earth Society describes the universe, Mr. Chairman, I think astronomers are wary. Uh, my testimony lists a trail of circumstantial evidence which I think indicates that the industry knows or understands that its ads appeal to children. 
Uh, the evidence includes R.J. Reynolds advertising at Smooth Character Camel in, in um, Rolling Stone magazine, which has 1.7 million teen readers. And, and R.J. Reynolds' ad says, write away for a cartoon poster and T-shirts and we'll send it to you. I would bet no one on this panel, no adult congressman, has recently written away for their free cartoon poster. But I bet you your kids have, and the industry knows that. A second, the Wall Street Journal, in a recent article, said that a R.J. Reynolds division manager had encouraged his sales representatives to pinpoint stores, quote, in close proximity to high schools, close quote. Last, and this is admittedly interpretive, Parliament advertises the perfect recess. This is not a word that adults use or relate to, but my 11-year-old daughter sure understood that the word recess means a break from school when you can have fun. Conclusion, Mr. Chairman, since we are dealing with the number one and three preventable causes of death in America, that is direct smoking and so-called passive smoking, in my view, H.R. 5041 is the most important pro-health bill considered by the Congress since the enactment of the Food and Drug Administration in 1938. Given the constraints of time, let me just cite three parts of the bill that I find particularly important and effective. First, Section 6 would outlaw all forms of effectively image advertising. In our image-driven MTV infotainment culture, images often carry far greater impact than words, especially for our kids. And images of youthful, attractive models smoking cigarettes are an insidious and misleading form of advertising and obviously attempt to link success, sex, and cigarettes. I'm glad to point out here um, that two of the congressmen who mentioned Norway, I think, got it wrong. The data in Norway show that the prevalence of teen smoking was on the rise before Norway's ban and subsequently has fallen since Norway's ban. Uh, second, the preemption clause. Uh, our consumer protection law in New York is much modeled around the country. We have broad powers to investigate deceptive, misleading, unfair trade practices, except when it comes to tobacco because of the Federal Preemption Clause. Then we're a watchdog without teeth. So I strongly approve of Section 13B, which narrows the Federal Preemption, which will permit states and local governments like ours to restrict tobacco advertising and promotion. Last section of the bill I'd like to comment on relates to billboards and stadiums. Um, my office did a survey and found that tobacco companies have prominent billboards in 21 of the 24 major baseball parks around the country, uh, which seems to directly contradict the tobacco industry's uh, statement that they went off television because kids might see ads. Well, don't kids go to games and watch it on TV? Which is why I'm writing today to R.J. Reynolds and Philip Morris asking them to take down their billboards voluntarily from these 21 stadiums since kids are affected by those ads. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, tobacco is a dying business. But there's no reason we should allow its dealers to make Faustian bargains with small children through false ads. In my view, H.R. 5041 is precisely the comprehensive, systemic legislation needed to keep America's most dangerous product from America's most vulnerable consumers, its children. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Green. Mr. Uh, Kyle, let me um, start with you because you've already gone through this experience in Canada and getting the laws changed pretty much the way we're proposing to do here. In Canada, I assume the tobacco companies came in and gave the argument that what they were really doing was advertising in order to get people to switch from one brand to another and that they were not uh, advertising in, in a way targeted to children or minorities or women. What did you find and how was that considered uh, in, when the uh, issue came up in Canada? Well, uh, that, that's exactly what they said and uh, uh, from the research that we did and the government did around the world, uh, we, we looked at all the evidence and, and basically uh, you know, Parliament just didn't, uh, just didn't buy that. And, and there, there are many studies that, uh, that show that uh, that is not true. And as I said in my testimony, we now have, have the facts. Uh, under uh, documents submitted to the court in Montreal, uh, the uh, tobacco companies, and these are the same ones that operate down here, have admitted that they are targeting uh, young kids, uh, non-smokers, former smokers, and they're trying to delay the, uh, the onset uh, as well. 
In other words, you had internal documents from the tobacco industry or their advertisers come to light in Canada that where they, in, in effect, were talking about targeting these various groups? This is, this is correct. This has come to light after the law was passed, and the tobacco companies have challenged the constitutionality of the law. And so there is a court case going on, uh, and RJR and so forth are involved. And uh, the, the court is still in session, and uh, we're waiting to hear the results. But under documents uh, submitted to the court under oath by the tobacco industry, it's now very clear to everyone that they have been targeting children. And, and uh, in my written testimony, which is fairly lengthy, lengthy uh, you'll see uh, quite a bit of this evidence. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm pleased we're going to have that for the record. Uh, I noticed that the, uh, the, the uh, packages of cigarettes that will be sold in, or are being sold in Canada have very clearly the bottom, smoking reduces life expectancy. Or, uh, uh, but in, in our country, you have to I don't know if kids need to put glasses on to see it the way I do, but you have the Surgeon General warning on the side in much smaller print. The uh, proposal would have smoking as a major cause of lung cancer right on the face of the cigarette pack, or smoking as addictive right on the cigarette package. And I gather it has a, an insert that comes out as soon as you open up the package. Is that yes, correct? This has been announced by the uh by the Minister of Health. It hasn't gone through Cabinet yet, but uh, we're looking, uh, the government has promised uh, leaflet inserts, so every cigarette package will have health information on a variety of uh, diseases caused by uh, smoking and, and targeted to various groups in the country. So this will uh, help give people enough information to make an informed choice, because all the polls show that uh, until this ban came into effect, at least, the Canadians did not have enough information to make a, an informed choice. They know that smoking is bad, like standing in the rain is bad, but uh, mm -hmm. they really didn't know the health risks involved. Well, I think a lot of people need to be told and reminded about these health risks. And of course, these health risks, where they may see it on the package, uh, will become quite invisible when $3 billion a year is spent to try to make cigarettes attractive through these heavy promotions and advertising that goes into cigarettes right now, cigarette advertising right now. Dr. Dr. May I add to that, please? Yes. Um, there's been some discussion this morning about the American public knowing the health risks of cigarette smoking and that indeed warning labels are not needed to change. I'd like to submit some data that show that that is not correct. Uh, there's some uh, interesting information that comes from a Federal Trade Commission study. Half of the U.S. public isn't aware that smoking is the major cause of lung cancer, responsible for 80 to 90 percent of all cases. And two-thirds of the public didn't know that smoking is a cause of heart attacks, which is responsible for an estimated 25 percent of coronary disease. Even subsequent to our 1984 warning labels, about 34 percent of high school seniors still do not believe that smoking a pack or more of cigarettes each day causes a great risk to their health. 32 percent of women of childbearing age do not believe that smoking during pregnancy increases the risk of stillbirth and 25 percent are unaware of the risk of miscarriage or premature death. Well, I appreciate so that there information. Are some, there are some real problems here in terms of the specifics. Generally, yes, they may know that... So, so they may know it, but e even, even the assumption that they do know it is not a correct assumption. That is correct. Uh, now, uh, Ms. Williams, it, it seems to me that uh, in the minority communities, there's a special effort by the tobacco industry to try to promote uh, smoking. Can you describe what you've seen from your experience there? Unquestionably, Mr. Chairman, we are being targeted, we are being preyed upon, and quite often people try to counteract me by saying, well, they can think for themselves. But I'm here to tell you that when you are feeling hopeless, like many people do in my community, because they don't feel that anything positive is happening in their lives, they don't have jobs, many of them, they live in inadequate housing, they don't have access to health care, People are hurting, and yet these industries come in and prey upon those who are the most vulnerable. It's despicable to see what is occurring, and all we want is a level playing field for all people. It is not fair. You don't go into a suburban community and find what you see in, on Mack Avenue in the city of Detroit. And it's not just my city. Wherever you find a large concentration of poor people, you're going to find the same set of circumstances existing to promote death in those communities. 
And we don't have the leadership, unfortunately, that's standing up against it because so many of our organizations are dependent upon monies from those companies. Thank you very much, Mr. Blyling. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Kyle, as I understand your testimony, from your testimony, uh, tobacco consumption has been declining in Canada for a number of years, and the decline accelerated in 1989. Is that right? Uh, we have the uh, fastest drop in history in the uh, first uh, uh, the first five months of this year. Uh, it's um, it's gone down by uh, first five months of 1990. Total tobacco consumption has declined by 12.2 percent. In your testimony, you included the advertising ban as one of the causes of the decline in tobacco consumption in 1989? Uh, there's no uh, magic bullet. The government has announced a comprehensive uh, program to uh, combat the tobacco epidemic, and uh, banning tobacco advertising promotion was one part of the comprehensive program. There are other effective components as well. Well, the reason I ask that is, is that one of uh, the government's chief witnesses uh, in the trial that you mentioned earlier that's going on in Canada now, Joel Cohen of Florida State University, uh, recently uh, in his testimony, and I read it to you, uh, the question was, you said yesterday uh, that consumption in Canada has been falling for some years now, but that the decline was greater in 1989 after the advertising ban. Do you remember saying that? Answer, yes. Did you mean by that to suggest to the court that there was any causal relationship between the greater decline in 1989 and the ad ban? No. Isn't Dr. Coyne's answer inconsistent uh, with your testimony? Well, I've not met this uh, gentleman, but the government believes that, uh, that advertising is a key factor. Also, raising excise taxes has been another key factor, and there's about 10 components that have to work together synergistically to, uh, 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 to combat the epidemic. Uh, so, uh, you know, promotion uh, and advertising ban is absolutely uh, uh, key to the whole operation. It undermines the uh, public health efforts uh, of uh, groups such as the Cancer Society. Are you aware of studies, uh, uh, Mr. Kyle, of, by the University of Helsinki? researchers uh, finding that smoking among juveniles increased after the position, imposition of the ban, and that the Swedish government has found that smoking has been on the rise among teenagers since 1984, even though most tobacco advertising was banned in 79? Most of the studies I've seen, uh, including Brazil, uh, Taiwan, Japan, Norway, most of the studies I've seen show that when you restrict tobacco advertising or ban it, the consumption goes down. Retail sales go down. There may, be, uh, there may be other studies as well, but the preponderance of studies show just the opposite. It's the thing to do. But even if those studies are right, if you look at Sw Finland, Sweden, and Norway, isn't the bottom line that you just can't say whether a ban will have any effect on youth smoking? Well, in the testimony before Parliament, the uh, representatives of the Norwegian government came and said that the advertising ban worked in Norway that consumption went down, particularly amongst children. Now, the advertising, the uh, tobacco, rather, the tobacco industry tried to distort the facts in, in Canada, and uh, I can go into details, but uh, the, the fact is that consumption has gone down in Norway since they've banned advertising. And, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and committee, this, what you've got before you today is very modest legislation. I mean, uh, growing up in, uh, in the Canada, I used to watch uh, American television shows and so forth, and, and America was always the leader in so many areas. I've got to say that the United States is no longer a world leader in public health. The, the way the world is going, most of the countries are, are, are totally uh, banning these products or putting severe restrictions on them, and it, this, is, this has got to be the way to go, and I would urge you to do something about the tobacco epidemic in the U.S. and, and, and set an example for, uh, for other countries, particularly the third world right now, and I would really urge you to, to do this. It's, 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 it's very simple. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sinai. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Before I ask my question, I'd just like to comment. We hear about a lot of these studies from abroad in Europe and behind the Iron Curtain, or now beyond the former Iron Curtain. I think it's important to always remember when we look at these studies that two things have to be in place for them to really be 
effectively judge. First, it has to be a total ban in advertising and promotion. That's the first thing. And secondly, ladies and gentlemen, it has to be enforced. And so when you look at these studies, you need to judge them with those two particular things in mind. I have two different advertisements, and I'd ask unanimous consent that they be added into the record. And I'd like to show them to the panel here. The first one here is, a, is an advertisement for Cool. And it appears to me that it violates the industry's own code of ethics uh, by using a model of 25 years old or younger, or at least appears to be 25 years old or, uh, or younger. Uh, and it's linked to sexual attraction, which is one of the codes of ethics. And the other ad that I have here is a kind of a tombstone format. It clearly is aimed at the existing smokers, not trying to attract anyone new. It even says that in the text that that's who they're appealing to. It explains in detail which brand's best, but it doesn't have, as you can see from the first one, it doesn't have color. It doesn't have uh, suggestive images. It doesn't use models. It's without people. To me, I think it really demonstrates the uh, fallaciousness of the industry's arguments that its advertising is not targeted at getting at new smokers or at children, but only at brand switching. Now, under the legislation before the subcommittee, I'd like to ask the panel, this second ad right here would be permissible. The industry uh, could clearly have plenty of opportunity to describe this product in detail. And this approach must work because they're currently using it in virtually every low tar cigarette on the market today. So what's so oppressive about what we're trying to do in advertising and promotion? I'll throw it up for anybody who wants to talk. Ms. Atkinson, why don't you start? Well, I don't think it is oppressive. And as a matter of fact, the second advertisement that you have shown us is still going to be quite effective in an indirect way that no one has spoken about this morning. And it is something that I am personally uh, unfortunately very close to. I wrote a health column for a major woman's magazine for the last five years. When I first tried to talk about smoking in one of my first health columns, I was surprised when the galley came back and it was edited out. And I sort of ignored it, and the next time I did a column, the same thing happened. It be, being the leading cause of death, it often comes up in much of my health discussions. When I asked the health editor why she was editing out smoking, I was told that the advertising department will not let us talk about smoking in women's magazines because, in fact, women's magazines, for the most part, and minority magazines, are supported by advertising. Most of their advertising pages, in fact, are tobacco. So there's a problem with the flow of information, which is why I think some of these statistics make sense that I shared with you just a moment ago that the American public, in fact, does not know the real risks about smoking because the health information is not printed because of the power that the tobacco industry has on the advertising. So, what you're so the saying tombstone is, one is still going to be a problem. What you're saying is, is if there's anyone advocating the limitations under the First Amendment... I have been censored. That's correct. And I get outraged by it. Well, let me just add very quickly. Uh, I don't know how many times one's wife is brought into this particular discussion, but my wife has a magazine named after her called Mirabella. And Mirabella, three issues ago, had a, an extraordinary uh, uh, article in which, by the way, that particular x-ray I just showed you filled a full page and went on to talk about women and the hazards of women in smoking. In that journal, in that issue, she banned all cigarette advertisements. And I think it can be done. And they all kept popping back the next issues, and she is still slaving to get rid of them. The word freedom is owed so much by the tobacco companies. If you have somebody addicted, and there are 50 million of them in America, that is not freedom. They can't seem to shake this particular thing. Personal freedom is totally shot to pieces. So don't use the word freedom. And one final thing. Here is a little something for your collection, by the way, from Virginia Slims. Some years ago, I wrote an article and for the Reader's Digest called You've Come the Wrong Way, Baby. And this is a, certainly a great example. It says, save one dollar after your ne off your next carton of Virginia Slims. And then it says on the back, order a t-shirt for yourself. Targeting, no question about it. These are terrible examples of the cynicism of this industry. And they have now 50 million people who are on a collision course with cancer, heart disease, and emphysema. Mr. Kyle? Uh, 
Congressman Simonar, if I could make a brief sure. comment. Mark. You began your remarks by saying that a legal ban that's unenforced is no ban at all. One example in this country, it is illegal, and the industry has said they won't advertise on television. Uh, to use a hometown example, in a recent Mets game, uh, for nearly three minutes, the Marlboro sign was on air, on camera. Um, this is the equivalent of six 30-second spots, which is not bad. If it's illegal to advertise on television, then isn't it a violation of that law for Marlboro Billboard to be on air? Now, some of the uh, members have said, well, these ads don't encourage children to smoke. We have no evidence that it does. Kids smoke, perhaps, because of peer pressure. Where does peer pressure come from? I think Madison Avenue knows the answer to that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sinar. Mr. Whitaker? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kyle, in your testimony, you stated that since the Tobacco Products Control Act went into effect in 1989 in Canada, the per capita consumption decreased significantly in the first year. Is this trend continuing, and can you attribute these decreases in tobacco consumption to the steps that you have taken in Canada, many of which are included in the legislation that we are considering today? Um, yes, there's many parts of a multi-pronged approach or a comprehensive approach. You need to ban tobacco advertising and promotion or, or restrict it. You need to have uh, controls on sales to minors. You need to raise excise taxes. Uh, you, you need to reduce the number of outlets, uh, have cessation programs. Uh, you need to give people information such as the additives in cigarettes. The, uh, the legislation in Canada requires to, uh, cigarette companies to tell the government uh, what they're putting into cigarettes besides tobacco, and we have some very strong suspicions. Uh, Philip Morris, rather than to uh, give that information to the government, has voluntarily withdrawn from the uh, Canadian market because they, if it ever leaked out in Canada, you know, it'd be on, uh, on television, you know, what, here's what uh, guys are smoking down here. Uh, you need public education efforts. Uh, the Canadian government has banned smoking in all uh, workplaces under federal jurisdiction, and within three years, all international flights will be smoke-free by legislation. Uh, there, is, there is much happening in, in Canada, and, uh, but, but if you don't have, a, have controls on advertising and promotion, if you allow that to continue, it undermines everything else that you try to do. And, and it's, uh, you know, kids don't believe the school programs if they see the billboards across the street uh, from the school and so forth. So you, you need a comprehensive approach, but, but controls on advertising and promotion are absolutely vital. So based on the work that you've done in Canada and based on the initial results of the Tobacco Products Control Act, you do tend to believe that the reforms we have proposed in 5041 would have a positive effect? Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Atkinson, in your testimony you stated that the tobacco industry is under no regulatory restraints from adding hundreds if not thousands of chemical additives. As you know, some 43 known carcinogens have been identified in tobacco smoke. Do you believe from a public health policy standpoint that the Secretary of Health and Human Services should have the authority to regulate tobacco ingredients? And what are the benefits of regulating those ingredients? Yes, I do think DHHS should regulate it. And uh, I think if tobacco or cigarettes were invented today, that indeed they would not be a legal product. They could not make it through the system we have today with the FDA food regulation, drugs. Look at the way we control prescription drugs, and appropriately so. I know there is concern about advertising uh, prescription drugs to individuals on television. Why? It's to help protect the consumer against fraudulent claims, misleading advice. We heavily control prescription drugs, and they are not legal. We prescribe them to help people, and yet here is a product cigarettes. Many of the 4,000 substances, we have no idea what they do in the human body, and yet it is the least regulated substance. I think we need to start doing more <coughs> research on some of these substances, but also expand the regulatory capabilities of DHHS. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Give me the chair and I'll forget about it. Uh, gentleman from New York, five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've been talking a lot about young people and targeting them this morning. I know uh, some cigarette companies have really gone all out to advertise to tell young people not to smoke. And uh, like some, some surprising advice to young people from 
uh, one of the tobacco companies, do not smoke, and goes on and on to tell why young people should not smoke and uh, how to handle peer pressure. Uh, and we don't advertise to children. And then they go on to say in terms of why kids should not smoke. And some straight talk about smoking for young people. And uh, does smoking really make you look more grown up? And they go on to talk about in terms of you know, why they shouldn't. You know, uh, are you aware of this? Yes. What's your uh, response to that? I mean, you think that uh, uh, it's not enough, or it's not being done, or I mean, I, I mean what would you, your response be to that? <clears throat> um, like uh, many people in this room, I was once a child, <clears throat> and um, I have two of my own at this very moment, Mr. Congressman. The way to get a child to do something is to tell a child, "Don't do this. This is an adult activity. You better wait to do this. Be it sex, drugs, or cigarettes." I am not imputing a malicious motive to the companies who have run those ads. It is my judgment as a parent um, that that strategy is exactly uh, the wrong one. A second, if they were proud of those ads, how come I haven't seen them in national publications? I've seen them because the industry sent it to me. I haven't read it in Rolling Stone magazine. I haven't seen it in the New York Times. I haven't seen it in uh, a generally circulated magazines. So I think. Uh, even if it were well motivated, I don't know that it is or isn't, it is uh, absolutely no answer to a health epidemic of 3,000 teens and preteens a day starting a habit that one third of them will die from. Have any uh, others, have you seen this? Or you have any knowledge of it? I am not aware of that and I read quite a bit. I, I've never seen those in a publication um, and I go everywhere. I wonder, can you tell me where they're published? Okay. Would the gentleman yield? Mm -hmm. Of course, it'd be happy. To I'm share. told that these ads which you have here that say that they're trying to tell children were appeared one time four years ago, and they weren't in any major publications, and we've never seen them again. That's what I'm told. I'm not sure in terms of how many times, and uh, and I do not come from a tobacco-producing state, so I have no in terms of uh, 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 that kind of protection. Or do I have uh, people in, uh, t uh, in the district that vote for me? Or do I have uh, uh, any of the major uh, uh, companies? But the point is that I think that we want to be fair when we look at these issues, that we want to make certain that all the facts are on the table. You know, I'm not sure in terms of the frequency you know, that this has uh, appeared, but it, it evidently has appeared. I think that that's something that uh, you know, I think the record uh, uh, should reflect. And that if it has, I think that then uh, you know we should uh, make note of that. I think there's also another question in terms of uh, you know well, when we talk about uh, children, you know, using, uh, uh, being involved in terms of smoking. You know, uh, I'll be honest with you. I think that there's a lot of things that we must look at. And I think that when we talk about you know uh, Bangladesh in terms of you know comparing it to what's happening in Harlem with Bangladesh, I think that we have to look at the poverty. We have to look at nutrition. We have to look at a lot of things. So I think that you know just to say one thing and to isolate it, uh, 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 Commissioner, I don't think that we're being fair when we do that and just lay all the problems of Harlem, you know, on cigarette smoking. I think that uh, uh, that that's not that's not the right thing to do. I think that uh, there's a lot of things that I think that we should add if we're going to do that, if we're going to make that kind of comparison. Uh, uh, my source for that, Congressman Towns, was uh, certainly not myself. I'm not a physician um, or a health expert. Uh, but it was Dr. Harold Freeman who, as you know, is the head of Harlem Hospital, was the head of the American Cancer Society. Uh, he has done an extensive and detailed study which has gotten national and international prominence. He, of course, um, an African American. Uh, is not saying that all the ills in Harlem are due only to smoking, but it's his best uh, scientific judgment uh, that it is the leading cause of death in his community of adults and children. I, I can understand that comment, but you know in terms of uh, you know, Harlem itself and the hospital that he represents also has problems. I mean, so like we could go on and on. I don't think that's a discussion for this forum. But I just think we have to be careful when we just start piling things up and just start saying, you know, this is as a result of smoking, that's a result of smoking. You know, I never smoked uh, uh, at all at any point in any time in my life. You know, I, I've never been a smoker. So uh, I don't know in terms of, you know, why or what. But the point is that uh, I think that we just have to be careful and make certain that we do put the facts out there and we put them out there in a very effective manner. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll you back the rest of my time. Thank you, Mr. Towns. Ms. Nielsen? Yes, I'd like to take an informal survey among these five experts here. Uh, we heard testimony in the previous panel 
that the administration likes F uh, HR 5041, except they don't like the sanctions used against the uh, uh, mental health and other grants. How do you feel about that? Do you think that those sanctions should stay in the bill, or do you think they should be taken out? How many think they should stay in the bill? How many think they should be taken out? Okay, one of one each. Okay, uh, Mr. Kyle indicated that several of the forces uh, caused the tobacco consumption decrease. One of which was the ra the raise in uh, tobacco uh, tax. In other words, tax increase on tobacco. Should that be an element of 5041? I know we don't have jurisdiction over taxes here, but uh, should that be a, an element of, of whatever we do? If you're really serious about fighting the tobacco epidemic, in addition to controls and advertising promotion, I would recommend a fourfold increase in tobacco excise ta taxes in the U.S. I mean, the uh, why not tenfold? Sure. What's magic about four? Well, the the, the, uh, the taxes are so low in the U.S. right now, it's pathetic. We have major problems of uh, smuggling into Canada from the U.S. And the Minister of Finance... Oh, you want us to raise the tax so you be more... We, want to more? We, we recommend that every country raise taxes as a health measure. The Minister of Finance, when he raised taxes by $4 a carton in the April 1989 budget, said he was doing this for health reasons, and the health groups in Canada have been urging him to uh, do this even more. Uh, this is another okay. component of the comprehensive how, approach. How many... And, and smokers... Yeah. All right, uh, support me, me support tax increases. Let me get on my survey. Okay. How many of you think we should have an increase in, in excise taxes? Okay. Um, let me ask you, Mr. Kyle, what was the rate of tobacco use by youth prior to the uh, Tobacco Controls, Product Controls Act? Um, Could you supply that for the record? Well, the... Uh, uh, smoking generally is uh, about a third of Canadians uh, smoke. It was uh, was higher than that. About ten, it's been coming down over the last uh, ten years. Right now, it's about even. Could you give us chapter and verse and numbers uh, for the record? I could. I could submit that to okay. you. Yes. What's been the effect of advertising bans and consumption elsewhere besides Canada? Well, it, uh, when they banned tobacco advertising, we had controls in, in Brazil. Uh, sales went down when they put back the advertising. Uh, as sales went back up, as they've increased advertising in Japan and Taiwan, sales go up. Uh, as they uh, 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 banned tobacco advertising in Norway, uh, consumption went down, especially amongst uh, kids. Uh, Australia has had experiences. Uh, New Zealand has introduced legislation to uh, control tobacco advertising just recently. This is what I think most modern countries are doing. Now, we had a representative say that he had started smoking because of peer pressure. Yes. How many you think peer pressure is a more determinant about whether people smoke or not versus advertising? Well, can I, if I can make a comment, I mean, I'd like to oh. see how many you think peer pressure is the main criteria. It's impossible to answer that question Mr. since they're not mutually uh, exclusive. Okay. I agree with that. Certainly, advertising affects peer pressure. Yes. I mean, where do they get the message that it's glamorous and successful and wonderful? They get it from advertising and other places. You want to vote yes on both both counts, then? Yes, I do. Okay. I have a number of other questions I'd like to ask, but it seems to me that uh, the differences between the United States and Canada may account for the difference in success. Your warning labels appear to have had more success than ours have. Why? Well, they're, uh, they're very successful because they're much more prominent, and uh, they cover 20 percent of the front and back panels. They're not little tiny things that are, uh, you know, camouflaged on the side. And the, as I say, the government, seeing the uh, decline in smoking rates, is saying, hey, we're, this, this is terrific. We're going to increase the labels from 20 percent to 25 percent. And this has been uh, proposed by the minister. It has to go through cabinet. Health groups such as ours have been lobbying for uh, uh, 50 percent of, the, uh, of, of the, uh, each principal uh, panel should, should be a health warning. Are you willing to say, as one witness did last year, that uh, they're so commonplace and they're, uh, they're unnoticed entirely? The warning labels now? Absolutely. They, uh, they, just, uh, they, just aren't, they just aren't noticed. Uh, they have to be prominent. They have to jump out at you. And we have, you know, the new labels coming out with 25% with uh, the international warning, color yellow on, on uh, black and white labels. I mean, no one's going to want to leave these lying around on the coffee table. I mean, they're going to be too embarrassed. Uh, uh, this, this stuff really works. And, and uh, you know, uh, I, I think people will, will take note. Thank you. I thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nielsen. Dr. Rowland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I suppose that all of you subscribe to the 
smoke-free society by the year 2000 that you'd like to like to have that in place. Is that correct? Good goal. Yes. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Um, when one thinks about the economic impact of what tobacco production and manufacturing does in this country, I know looking at my own state of Georgia, when one looks at uh, not just the, the, the farmers themselves, but equipment deals, fertilizer, chemicals, supplies, many, many different things that are involved in this, uh, a tobacco manufacturing plant that employs 2,300 people in Macon, Georgia, cigar plant in Waycross employs 500 people. What do you say to these people whose livelihood depends on that at this point? How do you deal with that? Um, tell, what, what is your thoughts about that? Uh, Mr. Congressman, your, your appropriate question was, do we believe in a smoke-free society by the year 2000, not tomorrow? And uh, I, I would urge those companies to do what m many are doing, which is diversifying. I said tobacco is a dying industry intending the, the double entendre. Um, so uh, I, I would also answer that, uh, as you know, uh, thalidomide was a drug abroad, an anti-miscarriage drug, which led to deformity in babies. Our FDA stopped it from importation, thank God, into the United States. If a company said, gee, uh, we can ma manufacture thalid thalidomide and generate 300 jobs, I would say, uh, don't bother. Uh, work is essential, but it's not more important than life itself. You really waltzed around that question. You didn't answer my question. Well, I thought I answered it pretty well, actually. No, I don't, you didn't answer it at all. I said, what do you do? What do you tell these people whose jobs depend on that? I represent a certain number of people. Now, what do I tell these people, if I assume the same posture that you, uh, that you have assumed, what do I say to these people all whose right. livelihood depends on it? And let, let, me, let me make another try, sir. Uh, say to these people, if your 15-year-old said to you, Daddy, I'm going to start smoking, is that okay? What would you answer? Wouldn't you answer, honey, best evidence shows uh, there's a one in three chance you'll die from it. Don't do it. Therefore, you should act in your work day the way you act as a parent. So within, 11, within 10 years, ideally your company will have diversified enough to produce something that in 10 years society needs. What? What do you do? Specifically, what do you do? That's pretty broad, what you've said. Well, you're asking a political question. I am not a politician, though not for lack of trying. I added, though not for lack of trying. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, then. Uh, what are you doing other than fighting this? Are you doing anything to help these people uh, who may lose their jobs? Are you, are you addressing it from that standpoint at all? Well, I'm a consumer official in the five boroughs of New York City. Um, uh, I also believe in uh, more public monies for job retraining, which is not a subject either for me or this committee to entertain. And so my public views, other than my um, views as a consumer official, are, are not relevant. This is a very tough public policy problem, sir, especially for a member with uh, tobacco-dependent jobs. I don't diminish that for a moment. But we are dealing with the biggest health epidemic in America, especially affecting children. What about, um, yeah. I don't feel much sensitivity from you people that have these jobs. Uh, Mr. Rowland, job. yes. uh, I understand you're a physician. Is that true? That's true. Are, are you a physician? Yes, I am. Do you think that smoking causes lung cancer? Absolutely. You do? Absolutely. Uh, good. And in your state was a senator... Well, I'm supposed to be asking the questions, not <laughs> you. I know, but one worries about things that, are so, if, that you feel so persuaded by, shall we say, your position that you may not want to talk freely about it. Senator Richard Russell of Georgia, his brother, Robert Russell. I'm very much familiar with Senator Russell and the problem he Both had with died his lung cancer. Sure. I'm, I'm very much familiar know. with that. But yeah. that's not the question I ask. Now, let me just answer the question that you are asking. Would this be a concern of us if, because of this activity and, of course, of this particular idea that we have here, that people were laid off in cigarette companies because the sales began to fall? Are we to be concerned about that as well? I'm concerned about people having jobs in the district I represent. Well, now we might talk on that terms of well, the poor people in Columbia being laid off for a lack of cocaine market. Let me ask you this. Uh, are you doing anything to help uh, 
promote attention to the fact that there may be jobs lost and that, that you'd like to do something to help. You mentioned earlier in your statement that you were, said, Let's, let us not forget the human element in this, and that, that is a human element. The human element has to be balanced against other human elements, Doctor. Right, it does need to be balanced. And you and I have seen too many lives destroyed by this to think about necessarily getting that fine point of whether somebody's job is in jeopardy. That's a political statement, but it's not, a, it's not, it doesn't come in. In my hospital where I do lung cancer operations, I have a sign in there, Marlboro Country. And nobody I know should get into Marlboro Country. I wouldn't debate, I don't debate that issue about the, uh, about the health hazards of tobacco. But I think your higher, in, your higher interest is the Hippocratic Oath, so-called, is to do no harm. And as a physician to a physician, you and I are both trying to keep people well and alive. That's our prime consideration. The tobacco farmers I sympathize with if they're going to be losing their work. But you and I are devoted to keeping people well. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rowland. Mr. Bruce? Boy, Jimmy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kyle, I, each time you talk about the Canadian law, you, you mention the advertising ban. Um, but at the same time the ban went into effect, what was the price or excise tax on cigarettes just prior to the ban going into effect per pack? Well, the, uh, the ban didn't affect the price of, uh, of, of, uh, of tobacco. I mean, that's, that's a separate issue. At the same time the ban went into effect, did you raise the excise tax on cigarettes? About uh, four months later. And what was that increase per pack? Well, it was four dollars a carton of twenty. So it's a dollar a pack. It went up by uh, what forty cents a pack. Or so. Have you done any impact uh, of what that increase on a pack of cigarettes did? The excise tax. Uh, we we um, we suspect that um, you know uh, hundreds of thousands of lives will be saved eventually, and and we know thousands of kids are not uh, starting the habit. But what, what, was the, I, what I'm trying to do is you, you always emphasize in your testimony the, the fact that we were talking about an advertising ban. Right. But you never seem to bring up the fact that you significantly increased the tax. Well, no, I've mentioned it very clearly in my brief, and I've mentioned it two or three times, uh, and I've said again that both are important, that there's about ten elements in a comprehensive approach, and, and the two key ones are the controls on advertising and promotion and raising excise taxes. And it's very difficult to say uh, how much each one uh, you know affects uh, consumption but both are important and I've seen studies done internationally that show that uh, uh, controlling tobacco advertising promotion is uh, is a very effective tool that and excise tax increases are the two most effective tools in the comprehensive approach they they you need to there's no one magic bullet and and uh, just banning tobacco advertising alone it'll help solve the problem it won't uh, eliminate smoking but you need more than one approach now, in Canada, is it easier to censor items under your constitutional confederation? Uh, no. It isn't? I don't think so. Was Salman Rushdie's book banned in Canada from being sold here? I'm told that it was. Um, I, it uh, may have been voluntarily withdrawn. Uh, there, I, there may have been uh, some uh, temporary uh, controls. I'm not sure. But under Canadian law, can you censor items? Do you have the First Amendment rights we have? Well, we, we have a Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and there is uh, uh, commercial free speech and uh, uh, free political speech, and, and Parliament thought that this was uh, a ban on tobacco advertising was a reasonable limitation on commercial free speech. Has it been challenged in court? In it has judicial? been challenged in the court, yes. Has been? The, uh, yes, it has been challenged in the court by the uh, three uh, international tobacco companies operating in Canada. Okay. Mr. Green, I was just curious, you seem to have some really strong dislike about use of cartoon characters in advertising. I wonder how do you explain the use of uh, the Pink Panther in the sale uh, uh, by one of the companies on fiberglass and use of peanuts in sales of Metropolitan Life Insurance. Do you think that those are marketing to children or are those marketing to adults buying insulation for homes and adults buying life insurance? I don't know, so any answer I gave would, would be a guess. Um, what I do know is that um, the tobacco industry knows that 5,000 of its customers a day die or quit. They want to make a profit. They're allowed to. So they seek recruits. 
the same time they know that 3,000 teens and preteens a day start the habit. It's not illogical that they may be tempted to appeal to the universe of potential consumers to start a habit with their firm. And um, I asked uh, peers of mine in a city where we have hundreds of smooth character camel posters, do you know what the smooth character camel is? A majority of my adult peers didn't know. I asked my daughter and she asked her class about smooth character. She's 11 years old. A majority knew. Uh, Joe Cherner, a uh, philanthropist and a businessman and a pro-health activist, went to a sixth grade class in New York City and asked, how many of you know who the smooth character camel is? He reported to me that nearly all of the 30 raised their hands. So I suspect they may be using a cartoon character to appeal to, a character to, appeal to children. Just as our three now, networks... Now, Mr. Green, now that you've made that point, let me ask you the question. Did your 11-year-old daughter or did you ask any of your colleagues who did not know the smooth character whether they made any decision concerning smoking based on their knowledge of that character or lack of knowledge? Well, of course not. Your 11-year-old didn't make that... The, the, your prescient 11-year-old didn't make that decision to ask that question for class. Isn't that, isn't that the clincher? Isn't that the real question she should ask? No, it's not. Um, because there are some things that are provable and some things that are intuitive. I you can just give me an example. I mean, you've, you've used polling data of, of, of your friends as a scientific sample and your 11-year-old no, daughter no, no, as a no, scientific I sample. And I, my cu curiosity has peaked at why you didn't go ahead with this scientific survey and ask the, the real clinching question of her, this 11-year-old's class, how many of you contemplate smoking because you know the smooth character of camels? Sure. And um, I have, uh, time's you did, up. You didn't hear me. I, I, of course, didn't say it was scientific. It's anecdotal. The plural of anecdote is evidence. The, the plural of anecdote is, is evidence? Which is why my pro uh, panelists, especially from the Coalition on Smoking or Health, have cited scientific surveys in our nation and in others about the impact of cigarettes on health. I was just doing what many politicians, I'm told, do, giving personal examples of a more macro point. <laughs> we thank you for your personal statements. Thank you. Thank you. But, but thank you. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Uh, Bruce. Mr. Bliley? Uh, I just, Dr. Atkinson wondered if you would mind submitting for the record the FTC uh, documents you quoted. Yeah. Certainly, I will. And what was the date on that? Do you remember? 1981 is the FTC study, and the other data I was citing is subsequent to the 1984 warning labels being put into effect. So that's within the last five years. Thank you. Dr. Kayan, you're a, a physician dealing with lung cancer. Is that a specialty of yours? If you could pull the microphone over. Uh, if we look at the economic impact of people stopping smoking, maybe we won't need as many lung cancer specialists. Well, Just like we might not need farmers to grow tobacco. Does that bother you? I'm the only man probably you know who's trying to put himself out of business by trying to stop people from smoke, obviously, and smoking. Well, what about the hospital beds that won't be used? What about all the, the other health care uh, equipment that won't be needed? Uh, if we have fewer, fewer uh, smokers, it'll have an impact on the health care system. Well, what about people who make ashtrays and people who make c c cigarette lighters? They'll also have a terrible time. But I think the bigger issue is obvious. And from an economic point of view, won't you, as a physician, have other things to do if you don't have all those lung cancer cases? I'd be delighted. And I would hope farmers would have other things to grow, just you know, like I hope munition makers have other things to manufacture once we start cutting back on the defense budget because we don't have the need for that kind of defense. Exactly. Thank you. Any other questions from members of the committee? If not, I want to thank this group for, for your uh, participation, your assistance, and uh, we'll look forward to working with you. Let me just also add that there may be other questions that members might wish to ask of you for the record, and we would appreciate it your responding in writing for the record. Thank you. Our uh, next witness is represent the tobacco industry. Charles Whitley is senior consultant to the Tobacco Institute. Uh, Richard Mazursky is a professor at Florida State University. Gerald Goldhaber is a professor at the State University of New York. Norman Sharp is president of the Cigar Association of America and Pipe Tobacco Council. And I'd like to ask them to come forward. Thank you. 
ask that question. We are uh, pleased to welcome you to our hearing today. Your prepared statements will be in the record in full. We'd like to ask of each of you that you limit your oral presentation to no more than five minutes. Mr. Whitley, why don't we start with you? There's a button, there's a button on the base of the mic. Be sure to push it forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to request that certain documents, uh, copies of which we have provided, uh, be accepted for the record. That includes statements by Dr. W. Gary Flam, Dr. Theodore H. Blau, a legal memorandum by the firm of Covington and Burling on the constitutionality of the provisions Young. And without objection, we'll receive those as the documents for the record. Mr. Chairman, it's, it's very difficult for us in, in five minutes to really address all of our concerns about this very far-reaching bill. But let me just say at the outset that uh, we as an industry consider this in absolutely the same light as the Sinar bill of the two previous Congresses. Uh, we, we feel that it amounts to total prohibition of advertising and promotion of tobacco and tobacco products. Uh, certainly if advertising and, is, and promotion are reduced to what would be left uh, after this bill were passed and after it was implemented by the Secretary of HHS and others, the only message that would be left uh, would be a message which says don't buy this product. So we consider it to be a total ban. We think that all of the constitutional provisions and First Amendment problems that were applicable to the Sinar Bill of the past two Congresses are equally applicable to this one. Uh, so let's make that clear at the outset. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there's another point that uh, we've been over many times, but it bears repeating. Uh, because it's, uh, it's absolutely factual. And that is, there's a, a great misconception about the purpose of cigarette and tobacco advertising and promotion. Somehow the notion is out there that our advertising and promotion is different from the advertising and promotion of all of the other manufacturers and sellers of legal products in this country. I don't believe anybody on this panel believes or anybody in this room believes that Lee Iacocca advertises Chrysler automobiles to expand the market for cars. Lee Iacocca very clearly advertises Chrysler automobiles in the hope that he can sell Chryslers to an existing market for cars. I don't believe anybody serious or believes that the makers of a laundry detergent such as Tide advertise because they're trying to expand the market for laundry detergent. Clearly what they hope to do is to sell their product to an existing market. Now, there's been talk in this hearing and other hearing about so-called targeting. Mr. Chairman, whatever targeting is done by our industry is done to a legal existing market. There's not any evidence whatever. There's not a single uh, study that we know of that demonstrates that anyone starts to smoke or continues to smoke because of advertising. Our advertising is purely and simple by our companies to sell their particular product on a legal existing market. Now I want to address briefly your, the provisions in your bill that would place restrictions on sales by adopting uh, Dr. Sullivan's model state proposal and then uh, holding up the, the threat or the hammer of loss of federal funds uh, if those restrictions are not adopted by the states. Uh, it's interesting to us, Mr. Chairman, that Dr. Sullivan and, and your bill have adopted a failed model, and that is the model that's now in effect on the sale of alcoholic beverages. Uh, the Congress, in its wisdom, saw fit to require all of the states to adopt 21 as the legal age at which young people could buy alcohol. Now, that was under the threat of loss of funds if they didn't adopt that, those provisions, and I think all the states now have done so. And I, uh, we know, too, that all alcoholic beverages all over the country are sold by licensed dealers. Those are the provisions in your bill. You would establish a new federal age of 19. You would require that all uh, cigarettes and tobacco products be sold by licensed dealers, and supposedly this would be done to discourage 
or reduce smoking by young people. The fact of the matter is that since the smoking age was, uh, the drinking age was established at 21, with all alcohol being sold at licensed outlets, there has been no uh, reduction whatever of drinking among high school students. And drinking among high school students is significantly higher than smoking among high school students. So if, we, if we're going to try to move in that direction, it would seem to us that a failed model would not be the way to go. Uh, getting beyond that into this whole area of youth smoking, and a great deal of attention has been given to that today. Uh, I'd just like to point out, Mr. Chairman, that in the Surgeon General's report uh, of 1979, we find this, and I quote, young people especially are aware of the risks attributed to smoking. As the Surgeon General has stated, by the time they reach seventh grade, the vast majority of children believe that smoking is dangerous to health. That's from the 1979 Smoking and Health Report of the Surgeon General. According to a 1979 survey of 2,639 boys and girls aged 12 to 18, conducted by the National Institute of Education, over 96% of those questions said that they believe, quote, smoking is harmful to health. In an article published in the journal of the American Medical Association in 1987, uh, a study said this, of 895 children and adolescents questioned in a recent survey, over 98% said they believed smoking is harmful and accurately named one or more body parts that are adversely affected by smoking. Thank you, Mr. Whitley. The rest of that statement's gonna be in the record. Mr. Mazursky, could you uh, be sure to speak into the microphone? Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Richard Mazursky. I'm a professor of marketing at Florida State University. I've been studying the effects of advertising and promotion for over 20 years in academic research as a consultant for a major consumer packaged goods company and as a staff consultant for the Federal Trade Commission, where I participated in a large cigarette in industry investigation into many of the issues and remedies of this bill, including, I believe, the study that was just quoted by the individual on the last panel, which I might add, I remember showing no difference in knowledge between users and non-users of tobacco. Based on what I have heard today, the justification for Bill 5041 and its proposed remedies hinges on four major and critical assumptions. First, that cigarette advertising and promotion increases the size of the aggregate cigarette market. Second, that cigarette advertising and promotion prompts minors to begin smoking and somehow increases the number of cigarettes smoked per user over time. Third, that cigarette advertisers successfully lure minors and other non-smokers into cigarette smoking with deceptive appeals and promotion. And four, that cigarette company sponsorship or association with special events like sports or music prompts young people to believe the use of tobacco will not adversely affect their ability to perform. The enormous body of published research on this issue, and not just intuition, spanning almost 50 years, clearly shows these assumptions are without support I will briefly discuss some of the major reasons. First, looking at brand share. Cigarettes, like many older, well-known categories, is clearly in the maturity phase of its product life cycle. Factors such as a well-developed distribution system, intense brand competition, and a very large generic presence within that market limit the effect of advertising on ultimate purchase. This was discussed as far back as the 1942 classic by Neil Borden, The Economics of Advertising. Any brand in a mature product category will find it more profitable to attempt a brand share strategy than one aimed at market expansion. It's a simple math, even if one assumes that market expansion is possible. Also, up to 30% switching rates have been observed in empirical studies of cigarettes. That's one of the reasons that a brand switching tactic works. Also, keeping a brand franchise is often as important or perhaps more important than capturing share from a competitor. This requires advertising. And finally, a very small share change can mean millions in losses or profits. All large volume mature product categories encounter these basic realities. The second assumption holds that cigarette advertising prompts minors to begin smoking or increases the amount smoked per smoker. This ignores the vast amount of research that clearly shows that peers, siblings, parents, and co-workers are the forces behind the initiation of smoking. 
Dr. Mortimer Lipset of the NIH National Institute of Child Health and Human Development reported that if one parent smoked, the child is twice as likely to smoke as one reared in a non-smoking household. If both parents or one parent and only older sibling smoke, the chances become four to one. If the child's best friend smokes, there's a 90% probability that that child will smoke as well. The Secretary of Health and Human Services have reported that over 46% of current smokers and a little over 41% of former smokers started smoking before the age of 18. Other studies cited by a number of individuals here also report upwards of 90% of smokers had their first cigarette before the age of 16. Advertising and promotion did not cause this phenomenon. Advertising and promotion bans in other countries, if we look at them, have failed to show that they have been able to lower the incidence of youth smoking that is, for example, in Norway, twice that of the United States. Another assumption is that cigarette advertising lures new recruits through unreasonably large budgets that finance somehow deceptive appeals that induce non-smoker trial and use. If there is no support for advertising and promotion causing initiation of smoking, and I believe that's empirically shown, attributing the blame to specific themes and tactics would also have to be rejected. Nonetheless, there is additional evidence. Although cigarette advertising appears large in the aggregate, it has lower advertising to sales ratio than many other product categories, such as beverages, canned and frozen preserves, games and toys, grill main products, uh, ice cream, confectionery, candy, soaps and detergent, a wide variety. The cigarette category, if we look at the latest ad age data, is number nine in measured ad spending behind such things as beverages, canned and frozen foods, uh, air transport. Also, many studies of adolescent response to cigarette advertising find that group does not like the ads and feel that it portrays distasteful imagery. Finally, the assumption that corporate sponsorship or support of special events prompts a belief that the use of tobacco will not adversely affect one's ability to perform has no basis of fact, no empirical justification. Comparing those countries with a ban against those who do not have been able to explain smoking incidents or belief, special event sponsorship or support is widely practiced by a broad range of product types because it can provide an efficient way to reach a market and because it can develop corporate goodwill among the general population. I am unaware of any evidence that goodwill induces smoking. Thank you very much, Ms. Mazursky. Mr. Goldhaber? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Subcommittee on Health and the Environment. I am Gerald Goldhaber, Associate Professor and former Chairman of the Department of Communication at the State University of New York at Buffalo. I'm also president of Goldhaber Research Associates, an Amherst, New York consulting firm specializing in polling and communication research services for government and private industry. My clients have included several large corporations as well as government agencies, including the Joint Committee on Congressional Operations. I have written 11 books on communication and lectured in 12 countries on communication process. My most recent research has concerned the effectiveness of warning labels and the use of the mass media to communicate safety information. Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to present my opinions on H.R. 5041, the goal of which is to reduce smoking by the public. Congress apparently hopes to do this in three ways. First, by scaring the public with warnings containing fear appeals. Second, by repeating information to the public that they already have. And third, by giving the public detailed information about the ingredients of cigarettes. The premises underlying this bill, however, are not supported by communication theory. First of all, decades of communication research has shown that fear appeals and scare tactics are generally ineffective in persuasive campaigns and may even be counterproductive. We refer to this as the boomerang effect, that is, the producing of results opposite to those desired. We all remember the highly charged, emotionally driven, graphically portrayed fear appeals used in public service announcements to encourage the use of seat belts. The campaign was such a failure, with most TV viewers ignoring the message, that among communication researchers, the campaign has been labeled, quote, the great seat belt campaign flop, quote. Uh, this morning, uh, we heard reported that half of Americans in the Washington Post reported that half of Americans wear their seat belts despite laws in 38 states mandating their use. Scare tactics not only may be ineffective, as with the seat belt campaign, they also may be counterproductive. We heard mentioned earlier this morning in the hearing the reference to the iodine labels skull and crossbones. 
Well, research has shown that placing a skull and bones on containers actually makes the containers more attractive to young children. H.R. 5041 proposes using fear appeal tactics for cigarette warnings by moving the warning to the front of the package, by making it bigger and bolder, and by using stark statements such as, cigarettes kill. These proposed scare tactic warnings might cause a boomerang effect resulting in people completely ignoring the warnings, or worse yet, making the cigarette product more attractive to such groups as young males. Secondly, giving the public more information about the claimed risks of smoking, either through enhanced or more conspicuous warnings or through new mass media campaigns, won't work because the public already has this information. Ninety to ninety-five percent of the public already believe, for example, that cigarettes are dangerous. Now, these are not general levels of awareness, but specific levels, and are from recent, not ten-year-old, government surveys. These are from very recent government surveys that indicate ninety to ninety-five percent awareness of, of health hazards associated with specific diseases and cigarettes. As an expert pollster for twenty years, I have never seen such a high level of public awareness on any other issue. As Congressman Bliley noted earlier, 89 percent, for example, know that George Washington was our nation's first president. 74 percent believe that eating foods with too much cholesterol is harmful to your health. And Congressman, only 38 percent know your own name. I can think of no other example in the public opinion literature that shows a higher level of public awareness than in the issue of the claimed risks from smoking. Virtually everyone is aware of these asserted risks, and some Americans still freely choose to accept these risks. Communication research has shown that whether it is the seatbelt campaign or campaigns dealing with drug or alcohol abuse, when the public is already informed of the risks, mass media campaigns to change their risky behaviors are ineffective. Finally, this bill proposes making several changes in the existing warning systems, such as adding two new warnings, one stating quitting cigarettes will improve health, and another stating tobacco is an addicting drug. On the one hand, Congress appears to be telling the public that tobacco is a drug of addiction. But on the other hand, it is telling the public that they can quit. Communication research predicts failure when you present conflicting messages such as these. Secondly, this bill proposes listing all tobacco ingredients on the package. This would produce a long and cumbersome warning that either may be ignored or result in information overload to the consumer. Regardless, it won't change smoking behavior. And finally, this bill proposes making several changes in the format of the cigarette warning such as those relating to its size, location, color, and the number of warnings. The authors of this bill are missing the point with these detailed format proposals. Suggestions on how to communicate a message presume that one has to communicate a message. As I've stated above, if Congress thinks they can reduce smoking by giving the public more information about the smoking issue, Congress is mistaken. The public is already as well informed on this issue as they are likely to get and are better informed on the smoking issue than on any other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Goldhaber. Mr. Sharp? Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, my name is Norman Sharp, and my testimony today is on behalf of two separate and distinct trade associations, the Cigar Association of America and the Pipe Tobacco Council. They represent separate and distinct types of tobacco products, pipe tobacco and cigars. Both industries have the same position on the scope of the advertising provisions in H.R. 5041. In our view, it is inappropriate to restrict the advertising of pipe tobacco and cigars for the simple reason that they are not youth-oriented products. Since the purpose of these restrictions is to protect young people, it makes no sense to include pipe tobacco and cigars. We have not completed our analysis of the other provisions in the bill, and with your permission, Mr. Chairman, we will submit our views for the record as soon as that review is completed. H.R. 5041 is based on the mistaken assumption that all tobacco products are used and marketed in the same way by a monolithic tobacco industry. They are not. The majority of member companies in these two associations are small and medium-sized firms. Sales of both pipe tobacco and cigars have experienced a dramatic decline over the past 25 years. For example, cigar sales have declined 73 percent from 9 billion cigars sold in 1964 to 2.4 billion sold last year. Last year's sales of pipe tobacco and cigars combined accounted for 2 percent, or roughly $835 million, of the estimated $40 billion which U.S. consumers spend on tobacco products. The findings on which the bill is premised are inaccurate with respect to the pipe tobacco and cigar industries. They purport to establish that advertising for tobacco products is intended to appeal to minors, and that the tobacco industry has done nothing to avoid the impact of promotional practices on children. 
Yet young people do not smoke pipes nor cigars. Generally, cigar smokers do not begin smoking until they reach their 30s, and this is a pattern followed by pipe tobacco smokers. Demographic information concerning the use of pipe tobacco and cigars in the United States underscores our assertion that youth do not use our products, nor do our marketing practices encourage young people to use them. According to the Michigan Department of Public Health, citing data developed by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the prevalence of cigar and pipe tobacco use increases with age, through 65 years of age, with the highest proportion of users being between 45 and 64 years of age. Smokers of both products are more apt to be college graduates. The cigar and pipe industries do not condone, much less encourage, the advertising of these products to youth. For example, the second of the cigar industry's voluntary advertising standard states, cigar advertising should neither promote nor encourage use by individuals who are or appear to be below the age of 21. Cigar smoking is an adult custom based on mature and informed decision. We can state unequivocally that those who choose to smoke pipe tobacco and those who choose to smoke cigars tend to be adult males who have the maturity to make informed, responsible choices about smoking. Because of the limited number of cigar and pipe smokers, both industries reach their markets through selective spot advertising. Advertising expenses for cigars and pipe tobacco were less than one half of 1% 1 of total tobacco advertising and promotion expenses in 1989. Advertising for pipes and cigars is done primarily through couponing and point of purchase advertising. Since young people do not smoke pipe tobacco or cigars, H.R. 5041's avowed purpose of protecting youth would not be served by restricting the use of coupons or point of purchase promotions for these products. Nor would that purpose be furthered by restricting such cigar marketing methods as, for example, Father's Day promotions or advertisements depicting such traditional customs as an American father celebrating the birth of a child by giving cigars to friends or someone giving a box of cigars to his or her grandfather at Christmas time. On another point, while our members do not make Godiva chocolate cigars or bubblegum cigars or licorice pipes, the idea of banning these products because they are potential enticements to youth is as misplaced here as it was with other provisions in the bill. The focus of the bill is on advertising and youth. Since pipe tobacco and cigars are not used by young people, nor are they marketed in a manner which is designed to appeal to young people, there is absolutely no nexus between the youth protection purpose of H.R. 5041 and the advertising of pipe tobacco and cigars. Therefore, we believe that these products should be excluded from the scope of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharp. Mr. Bliley? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Mazursky, uh, this legislation would still allow the tobacco industry to advertise its products, so how can the industry argue that this is an ad ban or a violation of free speech? Uh, well, you're kind of asking a legal question. I'm really a marketing expert, uh, and I guess I'd rather... Well, then, perhaps... Charlie? I would be glad to address that, uh, Mr. Chairman. We've got here a little mock-up of what a cigarette advertising would look like uh, under the provision of this new bill. I'd like to hand it up and let you let the panel have a look at it. If someone on the staff would uh, pick that up, please. I think you can see very clearly when the top 20 percent of any advertisement is a warning uh, with big red letters that say warning. And, and one of those warnings is that cigarettes kill. Uh, even though you can say this is just a, a restriction, uh, that's the first thing you see and that's the most prominent thing you see. You do away with color, you do away with logos, it has to be in black and white, and clearly the restrictions on this are so severe uh, that there would be no point in trying to advertise uh, if that's all you could do. The advertising couldn't possibly serve any beneficial purpose and couldn't promote the sale of the product. And in addition, Mr. Chairman, this bill uh, gives the Secretary of HHS almost blank check authority to require anything else on that advertisement that he might see fit to do, and I think we have to assume that uh, most secretaries would do that. Well, <clears throat> Charlie, we've heard testimony today that there is some confusion about the proposed warning labels and their effectiveness in communicating to the American public health concerns about smoking. What do you think the impact will be on the American public and are the new expanded warning labels a justifiable federal expense? Well, let me say the same thing that was just said previously. Uh, when a message is out there to the extent that this message is out there, there's nothing else really in the American experience which is comparable 
to the level at which the American people know and believe that cigarette smoking is a health hazard. I don't know why you need something additional to tell people what they already believe and what they've already accepted. Well, <clears throat> moving on, the tobacco industry argues that its advertising is not intended to create more smokers, but to encourage brand switching and, and brand retention. If it's true, as the tobacco companies claim, that advertising com campaigns fail to have a significant effect on increasing smoking rates, why do the companies bother to advertise at all? Why should so much money be spent simply to get people to switch brands? Mr. Chairman, when you consider the fact that in 1988, a 1% share of the American tobacco market was worth $558 million. When you consider that and see what's at stake, and that these companies are highly competitive. It's not just a matter of brand switching, although that is always a goal, but it's also a matter of retaining brand loyalty. So there's a great deal at stake, and uh, in the light of that, the, the level of advertising that the companies are doing to retain brand loyalty on the brands that uh, they have on the market and to encourage brand switching is, is very reasonable. Dr. Mazeski, do you have any comment on that? Yes, as I had mentioned in my testimony, that if we take a look at the percent of, of uh, advertising as percent of sales, that it really does fall below many other kinds of product categories out there. And indeed, the, not only as Charlie was talking about the, the large amount of money per share point, but of course the switching rates and the importance of holding your consumer franchise is very, very critical. And this is not unlike any other mature product category. There are any categories I had noticed that had the distribution, the kind of competition, and some other factors will all have the same phenomenon. Well, thank you, Doctor. Uh, finally, Charlie, if the tobacco industry agrees that kids shouldn't smoke, then why aren't they doing something about it instead of subtly targeting young people in their ads they say are for, for adults? Well, we are, Mr. Chairman. We have a, a considerable history of promoting a number of uh, uh, anti-youth smoking initiatives. We have some in effect now. We've had some extensive ones in the past in cooperation with the National Association of State Boards of Education. We're in the process of reviewing those activities uh, right now and, and expect to expand them in the near future. But we've got a long history of discouraging smoking among young people. Uh, Dr. Mazursky, I note from reading your resume that you were formerly with the FTC at one time? That's correct, yes. Are you familiar with the study that uh, Dr. Atkinson quoted? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, I think so. I, there were a number of studies that were done during the term that I was there. And in fact, I uh, participated in many of those studies. And as I think I was mentioning before, one of the studies and looking at uh, the various kinds of health consequences alleged of tobacco, uh, we found that, yes, there was a lack of information, but it was no different between people who were smokers as compared to those who were non-smokers. Also, if we're taking a look at young people, smokers versus non-smokers, there can be plenty of information people don't know. It's important concerning which parts of those information have an impact on the decision to smoke. It's very much analogous, I suppose, to expecting an individual to get a license for a car to know all the aspects of an engine because they can pass it. I really think that we have to talk about the kind of information that's important. Thank you, Doctor. Thank, thank you, Mr. Bliley. Mr. Sinem? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Whitley, you will provide for the record that 1% is equal to $558 million worth of sales. You'll yes, provide sir. that evidence. Yes, sir. We also provide for the record uh, how many people brand switch each year for us. Uh, we'll provide such is. information as we have, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure to what extent we have that information, but we, we will provide it to the extent we have it. If I might note that the 30% yeah. switching rate comes from an article done by Ehrenberg. Okay, uh, well, I if you all could provide some evidence to that. Our numbers don't meet up with that. Could you provide how much money you spend on kids each year, too, Charlie? How much money you spend on? Advertising and promoting cigarettes to kids. Cigarettes for kids? Yeah. We don't. Promote cigarettes. Gentlemen, you, uh, I'd like to, to know how much money, and maybe you know this figure, you spend on these efforts to discourage children. You claim you, you're, you've got a lot of... I, I don't have any numbers immediately available okay, on that, Okay, we'll give that Chairman. to the us for the record. We'd appreciate it. Charlie, you uh, said that uh, this is what the advertising would look under this legislation, and I showed you this 
as an example of what uh, we think tombstone average. There's not much difference between these two, are there? There's a great deal of difference. If you look at the two, uh, Mr. Sinar, the, the one that you have in your left hand, the bit, first thing you see up at the top is a great big warning that takes up uh, 20 percent of the ad. It's very in red. Similar, very similar That's to what you're already doing on Canadian cigarettes, right? Uh, well, that you're already packaging for Canadian consumption. Exactly what they're doing in Canada that you provide them. Is that it's, correct? It's, it's some, somewhat comparable. What you would require on the package is somewhat comparable to what's being done on Canadian cigarettes at the present time. All right. What else is different about these two? Well, you have some color. That's correct. On your this, other ad. Isn't under our legislation the color of the pack allowed? I don't think so. I think it all has to be in black and white, as I understand it. Okay. Let me ask you this. Uh, this ad right here is being used, obviously, very effectively to try to do what you call brand switching. In fact, it all but says that in the ad. What are you selling here? Yeah. Where, where is the consumer getting the options to brand switch? What, where are these choices in this ad? What are you selling here, Charlie? Well, are you selling a woman with clothes? In fact, if you cover that up over there, it looks like a clothing ad to me. Obviously, Mr. Chairman, any cigarette ad is, is designed and uh, planned to sell cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sinar. So is that for brand switching there? Well, brand switching, brand loyalty. Uh, clearly, that's an advertisement by Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company uh, advertising their product. You said that uh, the legislation I've introduced is the same as the one that I introduced earlier. You know that in the previous legislation I introduced was a total ban on advertising and promotion, and we now do allow tombstone advertising very similar to this, which you're presently using. Would you agree that there is a difference between the first and second pieces of legislation? Well, for practical purposes, Mr. Sinar, I think if, if your bill, uh, if this bill were enacted and implemented as fully as it could be by uh, not only the specific provisions within the bill, but uh, uh, additional requirements imposed as they could be, by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, I think we could very quickly reach a point where there's nothing left in the advertisement but uh, an admonition not to buy the product. Mm -hmm. Now, according to our new legislation, we'd have an expedited review by the courts with respect to the First Amendment uh, uh, questions in this. Are you opposed to that uh, section of the bill? Uh, we certainly wouldn't oppose an expedited review in any kind of legislation, mm -hmm. but that doesn't impact at all on our opinion that uh, this bill is unconstitutional, and in addition to the duty of the court. That's not what I ask you, Charlie. Let me ask you another question. Uh, is, are cigarettes a legal product to children? They're not a legal product for young people under 18 in that? most states. In how many states is that? Uh, Forty odd states uh, have a, a, a legal smoking age of 18. I think maybe the District of Columbia has 16. Maybe a couple of states have 21. Now, do you deny the fact that 60 percent of all smokers uh, begin before the age of 14? Uh, I don't have figures to sustain that assertion. Do you have any figures to, to, uh, to show that that's wrong? Well, let me say that we have figures that, uh, from the National Institute of Drug Abuse of the Public Health Service that shows that in 1978, that almost 29% of high school seniors smoked compared to 18% 10 years later in 1988. Now, that's a significant thing, uh, Mr. Sinar. Well, let me ask you this. Seniors Could, are doing would you deny work? the fact that the same public health groups say that 5,000 teenagers each and every day take up cigarettes as a habit? Do you have any figures to refute that? Uh, no, uh, I don't you, have anything to refute that. I, I don't have those numbers uh, uh, on an authoritative basis to admit it either. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sinar. Gentlemen, uh, I appreciate your testimony, I, and uh, you may be uh, requested to answer some questions from members of the committee for the record. We'd appreciate if you would respond in writing two written questions so we could have it in the written record. Do you have the um, introduction of the minister? I could just... Our um, final witnesses today will discuss their views of the, on the, of the constitutionality of the legislation and uh, specific issues relating to the advertising uh, provisions of the, of the bill itself. Alan Morrison is director of the Public Citizen Litigation Group. Floyd Abrams is an attorney representing the Tobacco Institute. Barry Lynn represents the American Civil Liberties Union. DeWitt Helm is president of the, Nash, of the Association of National Advertisers, and David Bell is chairman of the American Advertising Federation. We're pleased to uh, welcome you to our hearing today.
your prepared statements will be in the record in full. What we'd like to ask each of you to do is to limit your oral presentation to no more than five minutes. And Mr. Morrison, I'd like us to start with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here today to discuss the constitutionality of the provisions of H.R. 5041 dealing with advertising and the promotion of tobacco products. I have two propositions for the committee today. First is that an absolute ban on advertising would be constitutional, and second, that this bill does not involve the equivalent of an absolute ban. Now, as to the absolute ban, let me say that until 1986, there was a real question in my mind and most other people as to whether Congress could constitutionally ban the advertising for a product which it had chosen not to make illegal. On July 1, 1986, the Supreme Court answered that question in the Posados case in a way that no longer leaves me in any doubt. The Court said, in essence, that Congress was not required to make that Hobson's choice and that it could choose to ban the advertisement for a product that it wished to discourage but not to make illegal, and that where the purpose of the ban on advertising is to dampen demand, as it clearly is under this bill, then it is constitutional. Surely, if the Supreme Court could uphold a ban on the gambling in Puerto Rico, then the interest in upholding a ban on tobacco product advertising is at least as great as that. And so, as my testimony spells out in greater detail, uh, the four-part test put forth in the Central Hudson case has also been, been uh, sustained here uh, under this bill. And in that connection, the Supreme Court has made it clear that the connection between the choice of remedy and the goal is one that will be upheld if it is reasonable and that it is up to the Congress to make the necessary factual determinations as to what the causal connection is and what is the reasonable connection between ends and means in this area. There are several other vital factors uh, that further support the constitutionality of a proposed ban if, in fact, the committee chose to go that way. One, the principal aim of a ban on advertising is to prevent advertisement from enticing young Americans to begin smoking. Even the industry recognizes that the choice as whether to smoke or not is one to be made by adults. But the fact is, and whatever numbers you look at, it's quite clear, the vast majority of, young, of people who start smoking do so when they are very young at a time when they are admittedly not sufficiently mature to make the necessary determinations, and they do it at a time when it is illegal for them to smoke in 45 states in the Union. Second point, tobacco advertising contains virtually no uh, useful information. Indeed, one, hardly, one can look in vain to find anything uh, remotely resembling information. Uh, there is nothing there but images and slogans. And this has been a factor, that's, that is, the utility of the information has been a factor in courts upholding uh, or striking down uh, bans under the First Amendment. Third, most bans that have been stricken down have involved cases in which the information sought to be conveyed is truthful and verifiable. Uh, that is clearly not the case with tobacco advertising. It is hard to imagine how one could verify a statement such as quote, alive with pleasure, when a more proper statement might well be dead with cancer. Fourth, there can be no doubt that tobacco causes enormous harm to the physical health of those who use it and probably those in proximity of it, not the least of which features involve addiction. Uh, the, there is no question that the tobacco used by youth will injure a great many of them, and for many people, starting them on smoking, given the addictive nature of the product, is to impose a life sentence of certain early death on the youth of our country. For all those reasons, in my view, an absolute ban on advertising would be constitutional. But this is not a ban. Sections three and four of the bill, the first two that will be, uh, become effective, do two or three things. Number one, they make the warnings clearer. 
Number two, they make them more prominent. And three, they more accurately display the state of the knowledge of the Congress and the United States about the dangers from smoking. Section six, which would come into effect in three years, eliminates the least informative part of the smoking advertisements, and it also eliminates the most alluring parts of it for youth by cutting out colors and cartoon figures. If the tobacco companies have anything useful left to say, they can still say it. And the real question the committee ought to ask is whether the companies would prefer an absolute ban on advertising rather than the limitations imposed by this bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Morrison. Mr. Abrams. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. When you began these hearings this morning, you observed that we could uh, learn a good deal from the experiences in Canada, Australia, and France. And I put it to you that indeed we can learn a great deal from those experiences in a variety of areas, including law, except one perhaps, uh, and that is the First Amendment. We have our own experience with respect to the First Amendment. We have our own history with respect to the First Amendment. I would urge on this committee that it is to American law and history that we should turn for First Amendment answers. It seems to me, Mr. Chairman, that what this bill does is simply to ignore the First Amendment, or to put it differently, to assume that there are no First Amendment limitations at all on restrictions on commercial speech. At its core, I believe, this bill assumes what the First Amendment rejects at its core, that it is for Congress to decide what may and may not be said about for a lawful product, that it is indeed for Congress to decide what must be said about a lawful product. H.R. 5041 seems to me rooted in the notion that government may bar an advertiser of a lawful product from making virtually any decision of its own about what to say in an advertisement about the product, however truthful the advertisement. Virtually all such decisions under this bill are to be made by the Congress, a notion contrary to any notion of First Amendment except one which assumes its non-existence. The prescriptions of H.R. 5041 are nothing if not clear. It would leave cigarette advertisers obliged to advertise the government's message on smoking. Warning, smoking kills, and a number of other messages, while severely uh, limiting the location, presentation, and content of the advertiser's own speech. Not only would cigarette advertisers have to publicize the government's message and not their own, but they would be barred from presenting utterly truthful, undeniably truthful information about tar and nicotine levels, about filters and the like, unless the government chose to let them do so. The target of this bill, then, is speech, speech itself. Commercial speech, to be sure, tobacco speech, to be sure, but speech nonetheless. And what is more, the evident goal of the bill is not mere restriction of deceptive speech, which is permitted by the Constitution, but the complete suppression of truthful commercial speech, uh, which is not. When Congress seeks to limit speech to impose a stigma, as has been suggested earlier this morning, on those who smoke, it violates the First Amendment. When Congress seeks to limit speech uh, to make it, as one witness said, too humiliating to smoke, it violates the First Amendment. Uh, when Congress tells people what they may not say, what they must say, in effect, everything about what they must present about a lawful product, it violates the First Amendment. I refer the committee to the recent Peel case of the Supreme Court as a refutation for the suggestion that the Posadas case is a complete answer to all commercial speech questions uh, in this area. And in conclusion, I cite the committee by way of illustration more than anything else, to the statements of Justice Scalia and Justice Brennan, people representing quite opposite wings of the Supreme Court, but who said much the same thing. Justice Scalia said, the premise of our system is that there is no such thing as too much speech, that the people are not foolish but intelligent and will separate the wheat from the chaff. This bill doesn't believe that, and this bill doesn't trust the public to make those decisions. And similarly, as Justice Brennan has observed, the First Amendment presupposes that people will perceive their own best interests if only they are well enough informed and that the best means to that end is to open the channels of communication 
rather than to close them. This bill closes the channel of communication. It makes Congress the decision maker about what may be said, and for that reason, it is unconstitutional. Thank you very much, Mr. Abrams. Mr. Lynn. Thank you. The American Civil Liberties Union is very gravely concerned that uh, this bill would, in fact, prove to be a de facto ban on national tobacco advertising and set a very dangerous precedent for the free speech of any advertisers whose product ever becomes controversial. I realize that morning, this morning it is tobacco advertisements that have become the two live crew of commercial speech, but there's nothing to say that tomorrow or the next day that product will not be condoms or red meat or alcohol. The layers and layers of prohibitions and regulations and warnings in this bill essentially will require the constant policing and attention of the government on the advertising of tobacco products. Advertisers, we must remember, are engaged in a core activity protected by the Constitution, and that is speech. Even if the speech is commercial, where the speech is not misleading or deceptive, Congress has not demonstrated earlier or during the hearing today any legitimate justification for such extraordinary methods to regulate it. There's no doubt in our mind that this bill would, in fact, violate contemporary constitutional standards on the protection of free speech, that it would run afoul of the tests established and not, never repudiated in the central Hudson decision. There are three specific constitutional issues I'd like to highlight. First of all, this bill prohibits the use of human or cartoon figures, tobacco trademarks, logos, symbols, and pictures from any tobacco advertisement. These content restrictions at best permit advertisers merely to show that their product exists, but it will effectively make the advertisement of any particular brand or any specific product like trying to sell a very thin needle from behind a very large haystack. Invisibility seems to be the goal of this bill. The First Amendment simply does not countenance content control of advertising of lawful products. That is the unequivocal message of a chain of Supreme Court cases, including ones which have found unconstitutional various restrictions on the form of advertising copy. One case specifically rejected a general theory that visual content in advertising is somehow inherently deceptive or misleading. This bill is the very kind of sensorial interference in marketing that the Constitution does not permit. The second issue that concerns us is the effective removal of preemption. The current federal warning requirements, which we have not objected to, represent a modest intrusion into the otherwise untrammeled right of publishers to print what they choose. This bill effectively removes federal preemption with regard to most tobacco advertising. By discarding the current law, the proposed legislation leaves the door wide open for state-imposed requirements, which, given current public attitudes, could well become so complex and costly that it would result in the near prohibition of the promotion or sale of these products. For example, states might enact laws that say no bus bearing a tobacco advertisement might travel within 100 yards of a school or a church. could even require that cigarette packages contain gold leaf. Uh, Congress has currently preempted this field because it believed that the federal government was in the best position to make determinations about the kinds of information that should be made available and the kinds of warnings that should be required. Since Congress has determined that tobacco is a unique product, it is not surprising that advertising regulation, this federal preemption in the law, is also unique. With the removal of federal preemption, Tobacco would become the target of local legislative efforts to set up a maze of impediments to advertising on popular products involving tobacco. Mr. Mark Green, my friend uh, on most issues, illustrated this world of local anti-tobacco forces very well earlier today. He doesn't even want tobacco companies to tell children in their ads not to smoke under the theory that no means yes. If they can't say no and they can't say yes, then it's clear that what he really wants them to do is say nothing at all. He wants them permanently muzzled. That doesn't give you the level playing field that an earlier witness talked about. That just ends the game completely. Third, on the issue of compulsory warnings. The ACLU, as I said, doesn't oppose the current warnings. However, we generally oppose any extensively mandated labels, whether they're on record albums or advertisements. The warning requirements in this bill go so far beyond reasonable regulation that they impose a burden on the speech chosen by commercial advertisers. These red letter warnings 
must occupy 20% of the space of the advertisement. Section 8 of the bill specifically grants to the Secretary of Health the power to impose by regulation additional means of regulating tobacco products. That could include additional advertising space limitations or requirements. The warnings then become so weighty that it would be reasonable for tobacco producers to conclude that there is no benefit to advertising their product at all. As Mr. Abrams pointed out, there is much to be said about Canada. It is a nice place to visit, but it is not a nice place if what you're intending to do is find full freedom of expression, because the Charter of Canada is very different from the Constitution of the United States. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Lynn. Mr. Helm, would you uh, pull the microphone over to you? Thank you. As President of the Association of National Advertisers, I'm here today because H.R. 5041 raises important concerns for all ANA members. ANA does not speak as a defender of the tobacco industry. The broad constituency of national advertisers we represent makes the concerns of this legislation a matter of principle. They are not product specific. Our member companies with more than 2,000 operating units market a variety of goods and services and dues paid by tobacco companies represent barely 7 percent of the association's dues income. H.R. 5041 potentially affects national advertisers in every category of advertising, and that's why I'm here today. The issue is not, and I repeat, not smoking and health. The issue is the advertising provisions of this bill, which are right here before us all, which raise three serious concerns. First. H.R. 5041 is constitutionally indefensible. Second, many of the so-called findings in the bill are nothing more than transparent assumptions devoid of factual support. They are conveniently crafted to reach predetermined conclusions. Third, the crushing advertising restrictions imposed by H.R. 5041 would destroy tobacco advertising in the United States and create dangerous precedents that would impair advertising for a broad range of non-tobacco products. My first point, H.R. 5041 is without question the most unconstitutional advertising proposal ever considered by the Congress. To underscore this, ANA commissioned an analysis by New York University Law School professor and constitutional expert Bert Newborn. I request that it be made a part of the permanent hearing a permanent record of this hearing. Professor Newborn concluded, taken as a whole, the bill is flatly unconstitutional as a hopelessly overbroad interference with commercial speech. Taken separately, not one of the bill's components can withstand First Amendment analysis under contemporary Supreme Court standards. To my second point, the onerous advertising restrictions proposed in the bill are neither scientifically nor factually based. The bill is like a trial in which the prosecutor absolves himself from the burden of proof. Not one iota of proof exists in the record, and the record that's been made here today, to establish a causal link between the use of colors and human figures in tobacco advertising and underage smoking. Indeed, the concept of human behavior being involuntarily triggered by color or by the mere presence of a human form would be more at home in a child's science fiction novel or a voodoo ritual than in an allegedly serious attempt by Congress to address a public health issue. My third concern is a dangerous precedence that H.R. 5041 would establish. Advertisers recognize that this bill is not primarily about tobacco advertising, but about creating precedence to allow for massive censorship for numerous non-tobacco products. Here's why. The tombstone requirements that H.R. 5041 imposes on tobacco advertising would jeopardize the use of creative techniques to market other controversial products. Once the mere use of an attractive message is viewed as fair game for the censor's blue pencil, the temptation will be overwhelming to use the new censorship tool against other permissible yet disfavored speech. H.R. 5041 creates an unprecedented censorship scheme. I hope the members of the subcommittee understand the recipe for censorship provided on this chart. It summarizes a witch's brew of unconstitutional provisions. 
As a citizen, I find H.R. 5041 personally offensive because it would allow the government to tell me precisely what it wants me to hear about tobacco products and completely compromise my constitutional right to make an informed purchase decision. With your indulgence, I include with one final thought on the constitutional issue. The late Senator Sam Irvin from my home state of North Carolina expressed it very clearly and very forcefully. Every congressman, he said, is bound by his oath to support the Constitution and to determine to the best of his ability whether proposed legislation is constitutional when he cast his vote in respect to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Helm. And uh, let's see. Mr. Uh, Bell. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am uh, David Bell, president of Bozell, the 14th largest United States advertising agency. Uh, we have no cigarette accounts. I have five children, three under the legal smoking age, two on the cusp, none of the five smoke. For purposes of this discussion, I'm chairman of the American Advertising Federation. Uh, my agency is a member of the American Association of Advertising Agencies. But more importantly, I represent the Freedom to Advertise Coalition, which in addition to those two organizations includes the Association of National Advertisers, the Magazine Publishers Association, the Outdoor Advertising Association of America, and the Point of Purchase Advertising Institute. Maybe most important, as nearly as I can tell, I am the only advertising professional and advertising practitioner to testify in this hearing today. The ACLU has articulated constitutional arguments. I'd like to ask that the statement of the Washington Legal Foundation be entered into the record and also a paper on the expedited judicial review. Could you identify those documents again? Yes, they're right here. One is the statement of the Washington Legal Foundation. Washington Legal Foundation. The second one is a position paper on the expedited judicial review. Uh, without objection, it'll be received for the record. The Freedom to Advertise Coalition supports the right to truthfully advertise legal products. We believe that H.R. 5041 is not a compromise, but it is indeed an outright ban. I don't know an advertiser or a marketer in their right mind that would pay to run this kind of advertising, especially with the kind of high stakes that are involved in the marketing game in this country today, where share points in industries can go from millions of dollars to literally hundreds of millions of dollars. That that you see there is not advertising. It is not information. It certainly does not allow an adult legal consumer to either differentiate or make choices. In fact, it's not even free speech. I'm here specifically because 80% of this bill, 5041, deals with advertising. And yet it's based on two advertising assumptions which are basically false. The first is that advertisers spend dollars against category non-users. I started in this business in media where the dollars are planned and spent and where the programs are put together. And the first fundamental precept that marketers and advertisers learn is that you put advertising where users can see them. There's a fundamental basis of cost per thousand users as the most productive, effective way to market and advertise products. I've never in 25 years seen a media plan where cost per thousand non-users was a major issue involved in marketing, or where one involved planned spending toward people who can't use the product. Tobacco is no exception. In fact, the principle is more intense in a mature market and one where market is declining. And we have seen major share differences in tobacco company as a result of advertising in the last several years. The second flawed premise is that much of the advertising of the tobacco industry is specifically designed to appeal to minors, and that colors, pictures, people, trademarks, and cartoon characters create an enticement for those young minors to start smoking. Frankly, we believe that to be ludicrous. There are numerous examples of characters being used to successfully market products to adults 
where only adults can purchase the products. That's certainly true with Metropolitan Life, where they indeed market to adults, where they indeed have gain share. It's true with the Pink Panther for Owens Corning Fiberglass, Charlie Tuna for Star Kiss, Garfield Cat for Embassy Suites, and a host of others. And to suggest that the use of characters and colors and brand logos is part of a diabolical scheme to entice young people simply flies in the face of advertising principles and even common sense. H.R. 5041 results in a ban on tobacco advertising. Worse from our standpoint, it results in government censorship and an attack wrongfully on advertising as a means to address societal problems. Therefore, we respectfully urge the committee to reject this proposal. Thank you very much, uh, Bell, for your testimony. We have a vote, but I think uh, I'll take my five minutes before, and then we'll come back after the vote. Y you say it's ludicrous, the idea that they would be advertising to uh, minors uh, by uh, characters and some of these ways that uh, make cigarette smoking attractive, yet you don't have any cigarette advertising that you handle. Is that uh, correct? That is correct. When we asked your association to send some witnesses that had cigarette accounts, we were told we couldn't get a witness like that. You only wanted to come send who you wanted to talk about the general principles. I think I represent the largest advertising industry trade association. Mm -hmm. I'm also representing the Freedom to Advertise Coalition. And as that chairman, it seems only appropriate that I'd be here to represent them. Well, we, uh, certainly would think it's appropriate to have you here, but we have asked for advertisers that, that uh, have the cigarette accounts, and uh, we haven't seen any of them willing to come forward to testify. Now, let me point out the fact that this, there's some misreading of the legislation. This ad would be permitted, including this color. The only difference would be there'd have to be a warning label on the uh, advertisement. And there seems to be some thought, obviously, expressed in this uh, brochure put out by the tobacco industry that we would prevent uh, the use of colors. Uh, and Chairman. therefore, I'm not asking a question. I'm pointing out a fact. And so therefore, I want it understood, this ad would be permitted. What would not be permitted would be that other ad, such as this, to try to make cigarettes attractive, appealing, alluring to whomever it might well have that uh, effect. Now let me ask the constitutional question. Mr. Lynn, you're here as a constitutional uh, expert from the ACLU. Do you think it would be unconstitutional if we adopted a law banning smoking tobacco? Uh, I think it's a... Uh, we have uh, never taken a position on the question of the banning of uh, of the use of tobacco. I'm not asking whether you think it's a good idea. Do you think it's unconstitutional if the United States government said that cigarettes may not be sold in this country? I think it raises legitimate privacy concerns that are probably significant enough that they would be of a constitutional magnitude. Do you feel that the laws that ban marijuana, cocaine, heroin offer constitutional problems? We do in the regard to a privacy, and at least in the arena of marijuana, have called for significant alterations in those okay, laws. Well, then let me, we uh, do that, think they raise the privacy. So, so you're so extreme that you would even well, say I, well, you that. But let me ask Mr. Abrams, the then, if, if that would be his view. Do you think it's unconstitutional for us to, to have uh, illegal sales of heroin, marijuana, cocaine, and if we wanted to, tobacco? Let me start with the others first. Uh, uh, no, I don't think it would be illegal. I don't, I, I don't think it's unconstitutional for you to ban heroin, uh, marijuana, or the like. Uh, nor do I think it violates the First Amendment uh, if you were to have a ban on cigarettes. Okay. It might well violate principles of privacy. It might have some Fifth Amendment. No, that's the enforcement, but, but we're, not the First we're, Amendment. But we're saying this is well. We ban a lot of a lot of dangerous substances, and we say there's a ban. People mm -hmm. can come in and argue other reasons, but the First Amendment doesn't protect that. The First Amendment that doesn't come into play in terms of a ban mm -hmm. uh, in that sort of situation. The fact that you haven't banned makes it very relevant indeed that you want to ban the advertising while allowing the product to be legal. Okay, I understand that, but I'm asking if we decided we wanted to ban this product because it is dangerous, 
I believe if we were starting with the introduction of cigarettes at this moment, we would probably not permit it. But we're faced with the fact there's a widespread use. Now, do you think it's unconstitutional for a state, if it chose to, to ban tobacco? I don't think it violates the First Amendment for a state to ban the use of tobacco. There are other things at issue here in terms of current law and preemption and the like. But if you're focusing on the First Amendment issues that we've been talking about today, I don't think First Amendment issues come into play in terms of freedom of speech or of the press in terms of banning tobacco. Do you think there's a First Amendment issue, Mr. Lin? No, there clearly is not a First Amendment issue. There's just a privacy and due process question. But you are against changing the preemption law. Correct. That has been written in at the instance of the tobacco industry into the federal statute saying the states can't act even though they've ordinarily had powers to protect the health, the welfare, safety of their own citizens. If, uh, uh, and you argue because you don't want them to, to infringe on advertising. Mm -hmm. Do you think they should have the right, if they chose to, to ban cigarette smoking? Well, again, it raises, as uh, Mr. Abrams said, no First Amendment issue. It raises other legal questions. The issue with preemption, though, is that because Congress, not the Tobacco Institute or this tobacco industry, has determined that tobacco is a unique product, uniquely regulated. It is not like toothpaste. You can brush your teeth on airplane flights, but you cannot smoke it's them. It's uniquely regulated, if uniquely treated because of the political skills of the tobacco industry over the years to place itself in a unique position. I think they're correct. It is your unique product, and for that reason ought to be treated uniquely, and that is to allow the sale of it because so many people use it. But I think the banning of promotion and advertising, I believe because it is unique, is constitutional. Uh, my time has expired for questions. We're being summoned to the House floor for the purposes of a vote. We're going to recess now to respond to that vote, and I'd like to ask this panel to remain, and we'll come back and allow other members to uh, complete their questions. Subcommittee will come to order. Mr. Bliley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bell, the assertion has been made that the Merritt ad that was displayed a few minutes ago by the Chairman, uh, with its color, would be allowed under uh, 5041. Do you agree with that assertion? <clears throat> I do not agree with that assertion. Let me specifically state for the record several of the things that that ad does that the new proposal in H.R. 5041 would not allow. Before I do that, Chairman Waxman suggested that no one was asked or that someone was asked to provide an agency principal that had a tobacco account. We've pulled the room. That request was never made. However, we are more than happy if the hearings are extended to provide a principal from the agency that created that merit ad that has the tobacco account to testify and would be delighted to do that. Specifically, that merit ad <clears throat> has color on the package. It does, not, it does not have a warning label in red. It does not have a warning label on the package. It has a trademark logo, and it has a proprietary line called Enriched Flavor. And it does not have the Health and Human Services Commissioner's message, whatever that might be. Uh, as the only one in the room who prepares advertising, that ad simply could not be made uh, and would require a 20 percent warning at the top rather than an identification to current smokers. Maybe most importantly, that ad was created out of the choice of the advertiser and the marketer to stand out from other ads similar perhaps to the cool ad that Congressman Sinar showed earlier, and it was their choice to use that ad to stand out, not the Congress. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Morrison, you, you mentioned the Posadas case uh, in your testimony. Do you think uh, that had Justice Kennedy been a member uh, of the court at that time that the decision would have been the same in the light of his statement or his, his uh, his opinion in the Peel case? Yes. Would you agree with that, uh, Mr. Lynn? Well, no, I think it's quite conceivable that given his uh, comments in the Peel case that he would have been on the other side of that decision. Would you, what about you, Mr. Abel? It's always hard to predict, uh, but uh, I, th I think there's good reason to think that Justice Kennedy would have been on the other side uh, of, of the Posadas case. Thank you. Uh, 
Mr. Morrison, do you know Michael Percher? Yes. Uh, does he carry some credibility with you on cigarette issues? Sometimes he does. Sometimes he doesn't, like everybody else. In 1983, when Mr. Perchuk was promoting the Comprehensive Smoking Education Act, he said this, and I quote, no one really pretends that advertising is a major determinant of smoking in this country or any other. You have any comment on that statement? I do not. I am here today to give my opinion as a matter of constitutional law. The question of whether that statement by Mr. Perchuk, if it's taken properly, uh, is a question of fact for the Congress to determine. And if and when the matter gets to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court will then assess the reasonableness of Congress's determination. Uh, we have our elected representatives to make those choices, and this committee first, and the rest of the Congress will make the choice thereafter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all the questions I have. Thank you, Mr. Blaney. Mr. Sinai? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, let me ask uh, Mr. Helms. If I work with you and we work out the problems that you have identified with this ad that you say don't meet the legislative language of this to where this kind of an ad would be allowed, will you just support the tombstone advertising since Absol you're presently using it? Absolutely not, because every ad that runs for a tobacco company will look exactly the same, and the government has become the art director and the creative director. Well, that's a pretty disingenuous concern, then. Barry, well, let me it, talk it, to you, it then. It violates the Constitution. Other than that, there's no problem. This violates the Constitution? No. Uh, any such agreement as you proposed is mm -hmm. taken away free choice. But if I, if I write it to where this ad would be permitted, what are you going to do about allowing... Under, how can that violate the Constitution? because you've taken away the right of free choice of the tobacco companies and you have mandated the way that they conduct their advertising. Okay. Furthermore, you're overlooking that the states, all 50 states, could then add anything they wanted to to that ad in the, in the way of requirements and you effectively would wipe out national advertising. Okay, Barry, let me talk to you for a second here. I got here an ad from the Wall Street Journal. This is about a new securities issue. As you know, these uh, I ads are heavily regulated. You know why they historically were put in place was to protect orphans and widows from unscrupulous security dealers from preying upon them. That's is that correct. a correct that summary? That is correct. All right. Now, you would agree that the risk and injury uh, to consumers who purchase uh, securities is a little bit less than what it would be for cigarettes. Would you agree with that? Uh, I might agree with that, but the issue then right, becomes... Let me, let me finish. All right. You will agree also that pharmaceutical drug advertisements have also been heavily, heavily regulated? Uh, we have, and we have complained about what we consider to be the over-regulation of those advertisements. Have you complained about this? Uh, I, I have suggested in the past that, that we don't think that those provide any information at all and therefore may in fact keep that widow or, or orphan from learning something that he or she would like to know about the purchase of securities. If you have to send away for a prospectus, you may decide not to bother. So I think there's an argument that says that kind of advertising really doesn't give enough information or that in this enlightened age of 1990, we should be giving more information, not less, even to widows and orphans. Well, could you explain to us what kind of information this ad gives the consumers? Well, I think it gives the, uh, I guess I'd give the same answer that uh, Mr. Whitley gave this morning. It says that there's a product called Cool, that it's mild, and that you should buy it. And this helps the consumer make a decision about... Well, it makes, uh, it allows a consumer to know that there is something called Cool and that uh, he or she might want to purchase it. Now, Barry, it. all this would be permissible if I worked the problems out that they identify. What, what would be wrong then? Well, if this what would is, be... If this was within the ballpark, why can't this be within the ballpark, Barry? <clears throat> well, because any effort to take that merit ad and turn it into a slightly different ad, if it is mandated by the government, runs afoul of that whole line of Supreme Court cases that say that content cannot be dictated what? by the government. You can't serve as the determinant of what kind of copy people are allowed to utilize to identify potential consumers. Alan, do you agree with that? <laughs> I do not. I think that there is a heavy burden placed upon the legislature in restricting the content of advertisements. 
And I believe that this record, and if supported by this and other testimony today and elsewhere, the findings made in H.R. 5041 would support the kind of restrictions that the bill has imposed. Indeed, in my view, they would also support an absolute ban uh, on advertisement. Uh, one could hardly refer to, to the Tombstone ad as anything else but a restriction on content. And uh, I don't think that very many people today, except perhaps Mr. Lynn, would argue that that violates the First Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Gentleman has time left over. Yield to me. Uh, uh, Mr. Lynn, do you think it's uh, unconstitutional in violation of the First Amendment when we say that in advertising of prescription drugs that uh, all the side effects have to be listed? Isn't that a restriction on content? Uh, it, it is, and in, within a certain range, I think that uh, those kind of restrictions can be required of the producers of any kind of, a pro of uh, products that create dangerous side effects. My uh, comment to Congressman Sinar had to do with whether in all circumstances these prescription drugs should be barred from the general media, and I believe I could uh, send you a, a copy of a letter that I believe we've sent uh, to you and Mr. Okay. Dingell about it. Well, let me just go on this more narrow point. Uh, you say within a range, you can you can uh, restrict or require additional information. How would you define the acceptable range to the point where it becomes unconstitutional? Well, I think that it's it's probably not possible for me to be sure that if it's six percent of the ad, it's okay, and if it's twenty percent, it's not okay. But this proposal before the committee today has additional problems, not just the size or how much information, but also who's saying it. The current law requires that the warnings say Surgeon yeah, General I, 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 believes me, such and such. I really want to, I'm, I'm asking you as a lawyer representing yep. the ACLU, I'm just wanting what is your reason, reasoning, I want to hear your legal reasoning All right. as, to, as to what that range is, not uh, the Okay, the this complexion. is so, well, the, my re legal reasoning is that this is so costly and so intrusive under existing Supreme Court doctrine that the proposals that you have in this bill don't pass constitutional okay. muster. If, if you require a warning about the adverse effects of a prescription drug to be on the sale of product and in the advertising of the product, is that constitutional? I think that is constitutional. If you said, though, that you wanted that warning to be specifically to encompass 80 percent of the advertising space, then I'd say that is so costly and so unreasonable mm -hmm. that under decisions like Peel, Central Hudson, you would violate so the Suppose the Congress looked at warning labels that we have on a lot of different products, and those warning labels are so small, yet we feel that the danger is great enough that we ought to require that the warning label be larger print so that the public will have a better chance of seeing that. For example, uh, uh, children eight, under 18 taking aspirin uh, have a possibility of getting Rye syndrome, which is fatal, if aspirin is used uh, for certain kinds of, uh, of symptoms, which ordinarily one would use aspirin for. Uh, so there's a, 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 a logic behind it. Sure. Is that good enough for, for it to be constitutional? Well, it, it requires a logic, that is to say that whatever you're requiring has got to be giving information that's valid, that's accurate, that is not itself deceptive and misleading. We're going to testify next week at another subcommittee on, on alcohol advertising warnings. We have suggested that they oh, are I'm not sure. inherently unconstitutional, but some of the specific warnings that are required are misleading and therefore raise certain... Okay, assuming it's not misleading, I don't think okay. any of us have a misleading... Uh a statement that we would like on cigarette packages, it's a question of uh, making them visible enough. Or do you doubt that they're, you doubt the veracity of any of the warning labels we're recommending? Well, I, there's enough ambiguity about some of them, particularly in the arena of secondhand smoke and uh, others that have been proposed, that to require the producer of the product to make the statement when he or she believes it to be empirically false, raises a very significant First Amendment question. You cannot compel people in the United States to say those things which they do not believe to be true. Well, we do that with cigarettes right now. The tobacco industry doesn't believe there's any connection between smoking cigarettes and lung cancer. It does, yes, but the course but we of the require them to spend their money I, 
that would have a warning label saying the Surgeon General advises this information. Do you think I, that's unconstitutional? No, we don't. But one of the key elements there is that it is the Surgeon General whose opinion. So if we required. said, as we did, I think, in an original bill back in 1984, warning, cigarette smoking causes lung cancer, and that had to be put on at the expense of the tobacco manufacturers, would that be unconstitutional? In if it view? was layered on to all of the restrictions that you place upon the promotion and advertising of products in this bill, yes. Uh, if so it was I'm not asking alone, this, that's my no. question. I think I'm trying to find out where you draw alone. the line. Well, if Is it, it when it gets standing... to be too burdensome to the tobacco industry? How about the burden on the public health? How about the burden on the public health system? And the costs that go into loss of productivity and loss of lives. Can you weigh that burden in to say that that burden becomes so great that perhaps the warning label ought to be larger? Or no. is it only if the burden is too no. great on the, on the tobacco industry and the advertising industry and their profits no. that that well, becomes burdensome well, and first therefore of all, well, first that of all, can't be the ACLU's position, no. can first it? Of all, no, it Not isn't. the ACLU that I I'd used like, to know. No, I'd like to articulate the position. It has nothing to do with lost profits, lost revenues for ad agencies or the Tobacco Institute. What it does suggest is that there is some point at which compelling people to say things which they do not believe in conjunction with requiring them to spend an enormous percentage of the space of their advertisements for those warnings combined with restrictions on content and then imposing or giving to the Secretary of Health and Human Services the right to do even more makes this so clearly a violation of their right to speak that it violates the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with profits. The we do have the Posadas case. Yes, we do. Five to four. Yes. Court seems to me to have more likely more people to add it to the five than to the four. I don't agree with that. You don't. Uh, but but whatever, the whatever, the, whatever the numbers may well mean for the future, it is the, it is the Supreme Court decision and I assume you would have disagreed with that. Probably, you probably argued against it, right? I, we, we did, but the point is that the Posadas case is a very narrow case. It's more like a time, place, and manner restriction than it is anything as draconian as what is presented in this bill. I don't think there's any doubt. In Puerto Rico, the residents can see those ads for casino gambling. They were quite visible in every publication not specifically directed toward the residents of Puerto Rico. Now, in this proposal, what you're saying is we are going to make all of the ads invisible, not just for children, but for everyone. That's a big difference between the ads you propose and the ads in Puerto Rico, coupled with the unique and un unpleasant, I say, would say, uh, judicial history of Puerto Rico, where constitutional rights seem to be uh, given short shrift in the criminal procedure arena. I'd say you've got a big difference between well, you the Canada, and this case. Now you're attacking Puerto Rico. No. Quite to the contrary. How about the Just Supreme Court? You didn't like their decision? Criminal procedure. I would never attack Puerto Rico. <laughs> well, I, I, I thank you for your views. Obviously, we have a disagreement. Mr. Blind, do you have any further questions? No, you were doing quite fine. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I haven't persuaded this group, and I must say this group hasn't persuaded me, with the exception of Mr. Morrison, who I thought made eminent good sense. <laughs> that uh, completes our hearing for today. I thank everyone for participating. and. Uh, uh, we'll hold the record open to receive the additional information that's been promised to us. If you would like further information about the issues discussed at this meeting, you can contact the sponsor, the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Health and the Environment. The subcommittee's offices are located in room 2415 of the Rayburn Office Building, Washington, D.C., and the zip code is 20515. Coming up next here on C-SPAN 2, a forum on environmental challenges in Eastern Europe. Good day from the nation's capital. You're watching C-SPAN 2. We invite you to join us Monday, September the 10th, beginning at 10 a.m. Eastern Time at...